Thank you for your patience in waiting for this. Thank you. I'm going to turn now back to Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. That was a lot more important to see that wonderful video. So, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, first of all, comment. Um, Boris, I know your festival probably deserves more, but I want to appreciate and say publicly how much, uh, respectfully, I appreciate the fact that for three years in a row, your organization has come in respectful of car, uh, council's objective and goals with the zero. Um, and in light of our municipality's ability to pay, we're turning the corner. A lot of great things are happening in our city, but we're not flush with cash like a lot of our wealthier neighbors are. So I want to say that right up front. Much appreciated for your $90,000 and your zero. Can I ask you a similar question to the art gallery? Federally, provincially, can you give us a reflection on how you're doing in terms of funding, dollars, stability, that kind of thing, Madam Deputy Mayor, through you, please, to Boris? Uh, yes, well, uh, to begin with, uh, one of the challenges that we face being an, a, an educational institution is that we we can only div, um, appeal to the Canada Council and to the Ontario Arts Council for specific project funding. Uh, our funding comes from two ministries, uh, the Ministry of Heritage through the National Schools Program and Services Canada. And uh, we have recently been very pleased to, and I'm pleased to tell you that we've had a, a two-year commitment with an increased sum of money from Heritage Canada. It's it's not a large increase, it's only $25,000. They, they, the total sum they contribute is 525000 but it is significant in the sense that many others are being cut and it's sort of a, a what shall I say, a, um, it underlines their support for the project and the fact that they think it's an important institution. And I'd like to say that most of the national schools are in major centers in the country, in Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver. Um, and uh, so we really, I think we're very fortunate to have their support for what we're doing here in Hamilton. Boris, just a comment since you're just so international in what you do. Uh, how's Hamilton Canada viewed internationally, Madam Deputy Mayor, through the boards? Well, I, I'm, I notice really quite a change in, in the 40 plus years that I've lived here. Um, it, it used to be that we were known as the lunch bucket town and uh, uh, of course that's changed and uh, now there's a whole new generation of people that don't know that. And uh, we, are, we are more defined by the excellence of the arts in the city and the excellence of health care than we are. Uh, and people are very open, except maybe in Toronto, to seeing Hamilton as being a major center of worth and of importance. And uh, I think we are turning a corner in the city. And it's no, no small thanks to the people sitting around this table, the council chamber. Um, this city is changing its face. And uh, uh, we're very happy to be centered here. Well, thanks, Boris, and for your prestigiousness you bring to the city. Thanks for being ahead of the curve, and the rest of us are catching up. So thank you. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, Boris, thanks very much for, for being here uh, this year. And every year I look forward to that uh, video that uh, you play. I'm glad we managed to uh, figure it out. Uh, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, it's really, you know, we, we deal with a lot of difficult issues on a, on a daily basis. Uh, Apologize for working on email here, but to stay ahead of it, uh, hundreds of emails a day. You kind of have to I'm sure. see what I'm working on. You're working on sidewalks and all kinds of stuff that you've got to kind of grind through on a, on a daily basis. But I, I, I just wanted to, to thank you for the work that you do and, and for staying in Hamilton and continue to, to raise the profile of Hamilton across the country and internationally through the work that you do. Uh, it's it's an opportunity for us every year uh, during this day to to reflect on. Uh, on where Hamilton is in the world, and I was going to ask the same question that uh, Councillor Jackson asked, so it was good to hear your response to that. It allows us, uh, I think as Hamiltonians, to, to rise above, uh, uh, I, that's what music does, that's what the arts uh, do, it allows us to rise above the day-to-day -day and, and look at uh, what's possible in, a, in terms of human potential and human capability. And, uh, it may sound rather dramatic uh, to say that as a city councillor, but that's what it means to me on a on an annual basis when when uh, you come and when I hear the uh, the update. Of course, HPO, uh, the other organizations as well, AGH, uh, offer a similar uh, feeling and and opportunity for for us here in Hamilton. So, just uh, special thanks from me for the work that you do, and and I look forward to our uh, support once again uh, this year. Uh, 
Madam Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Thank you, Councillor McCarty. I just want to underline uh, uh, something that Louise said earlier in response to one of the questions from the councillors, um, and that is that the change in the city, the change in the profile of the city, though very welcome and wonderful, um, does provide significant challenges in terms of fundraising, uh, in the sense that we don't have the head offices that we once had in the city. Uh, this is changing, uh, but, but therefore I want to underline how important your support is on a continuing basis is because people inevitably say, what's your city feel about you? And you say that loud and clear by how you help us. Seeing no other speakers, I will also thank you, Boris, and the presentation as was stated. I think we all wait in anticipation for that every year. So kudos to uh, what's put together every year. It certainly gives a, a tremendous reflection on everything you've done the past year and certainly what you'll be working on for next year. Um, so appreciate everything here and also staying on the zero target on the budget. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. We'll be receiving everything at the end of the meeting, but thank you again. Thank you all very much. I will now ask for a festival of friends. Please come forward. of council, people in the gallery, um, I do not have a PowerPoint this year and please do not consider that any kind of lack of effort. Please take that in the spirit of austerity. We are coming out of a tough festival and I don't, I don't know that the festival can ignore um, the presentation this year that it is important for us and we very much respect the notion of, that we get 20 minutes in front of council. But when that camera's in the room, we will be addressing some of the misconceptions that the general public holds as well. And if you'll indulge me, I would like to kind of review an overall history lesson that brings us to where we are today. So as most of you know, the Festival of Friends was created by the Powells in 1976. It was a small neighborhood festival in Gage Park that grew exponentially and became a jewel throughout Canada within the folk festival world. It grew in the 80s to a large extent in terms of its attendance and its reach, and certainly it grew in terms of its municipal funding. The festival had strong and passionate leadership and an awful lot of conflict with the city of Hamilton all throughout the 80s and 90s. In its 25th anniversary, it was a very special festival based on the silver anniversary, a huge celebration, a massive festival, and it left a mountain of debt. The year after that, the Festival of Friends was broke. Board members were leaving, and it looked like we were at the end of an era. Bankruptcy loomed, um, a line of credit had been maxed out, all bills on the um, just concluded festival left unpaid and a proposal came to the board of directors at that time 
suggesting an, a, a brand new strategy on the festival, which came from me at the Tivoli Theater that said we will absorb all that debt by operating this thing with no cost um, from a human uh, relations perspective until all the debt is paid. The Tivoli Theater was a a, a relatively successful venture. It had the bodies who were interested in doing this. And it was important for me to keep the Festival of Friends afloat some 12 years ago. I only put this on the table as I, I stand before you with an awful lot of false allegations about how the Festival of Friends is something that I take from. And in my perspective, it is something that I have given to. And I'm not looking for any accolades in regards to that. I just want to balance the field somewhat. So the, the, the conclusion of the history lesson is by 2004, the line of credit had been paid back. The festival was all current. And then, of course, as some of you remember, the theater went kaput. We were homeless. We fixed a problem just to take on a whole new one. There was an awful lot of community support to keep the festival alive in 2004. Um, council made special circumstances for us. Um, the spectator gave us a home. We overcame that adversity and kept things going. And, and the key from 2004 forward was to create a festival that could by no means ever be hurt financially. That it would always be able to pay its bills and always be able to continue its mandate. To some extent, from 2002 to 2010, we created a festival that became financially bulletproof. In spite of the fact that we were receiving about one third of the municipal funding that we were receiving in a prior generation, the amount of money we received from the city during that time is far less important than the level of stability our funding has received since we got transferred out of grants and into boards and agencies. We have stood in front of here every year, never asking for an increase. We are so thrilled that we are able to count on the City of Hamilton as a line item. But the Festival of Friends continued to grow, and we did so through sponsorship. And our sponsorship dictated that we produce a different festival than what was created in 1976. Incrementally, the festival has changed and grown more towards headliners. The daytime event is pretty much the same as it always was in terms of vibe and feel. And the headliners cost a whole lot more money than they ever did before. And luckily, the corporate community, uh, and it's worth noting, for the most part, uh, I'd say entirely in terms of the big guys, is not uh, Hamilton money, that we are getting national support from the corporate uh, community. So our performer bid budget has grown huge until we were faced with another dilemma, which was our issues of remaining in Gage Park or not. And the issue that was before us comes down to one simple statement. We either had to move or shrink. It is counterintuitive to want to entertain less people and attract less of a crowd. So we spent about six months um, with board members involved creating a task force to find the best location to move to. And that choice uh, had a clear winner being the Ancaster Fairgrounds. The Hamilton Police, the Ward Councilor, Al Dore representing the Parks Department, we did everything we could for years to be able to stay engaged, and it just didn't work. Our very first show on the very first night of our time in Ancaster, which of course was the Sheepdogs in City and Color, created an absolute storm, but it will be remembered as the largest gathering of Hamiltonians in the history of this city. No one was injured. It was absolute craziness, um, but we prefer to remember all the positivity. It's going to be this generation's Pink Floyd concert at Ivor Wynn 30 years from now. Nobody's here is old enough to remember that one, so it's okay. <laughs> I stand here representing the board, all, its, all our volunteers, all the musicians that play, all of the above. And, and I take this um, awfully darn seriously. This is important, not just to me, but to those who participate as well. 
Festival of Friends has not been um, a huge money maker in the bank account of I, and I don't regret that in any way, shape, or form. But what it has done is opened up a world of opportunity for me. Because of the connections I've made in the industry in which I work, um, I am somewhat of a um, local pariah in terms of the squawking I do locally. I know that and I get that. I have a good level of self-awareness. Outside this community and all over North America, I am a respected um, guest speaker on how to promote shows. I've been working um, corporately throughout the Caribbean, all over the states and Canada, uh, in Germany. I'm thrilled to do so. None of that would have happened without my connection to the Festival of Friends. So getting the background out of the way and what brings us to where we are and standing in front of you today. There was an awful lot of positivity to the 2012 Festival of Friends, although overall it's among the worst years we've ever had. So within, within the little booklets, um, there's, and, I, and I don't do so to be cheeky, there's the weather reports. It rained eight times in three days. We have had rain. Um, we have never had such constant reoccurring rain. And the Festival of Friends translates to three different events. We understand that people decide what day they're coming. And if it rains on Friday, Saturday's gonna turn out better and, and down the line it goes. It rained a lot and it rained every day. But we did get a Sunday night this year out of our activities and there's some pretty impressive pictures. But more than just the pictures, what we created on that Sunday night by having Lights, who has vast appeal from 15 year olds to 25 year olds, opening for the B-52s, who is more of mine and your generation, there was a wonderful cross-pollination of music fans that occurred. And I've never seen anything like it at a concert before, where the baby boomers stood at the back while the kids enjoyed it, and then they just switched positions. I'm not sure that I've explained that in a manner that made it as nifty to me, but to see two distinct audiences um, respecting uh, the others performance was certainly um, worth noting in my, in my estimation. We achieved something monumental this year, and by that, the creation of the Festival of Friends Music Museum. We have a long and interesting story to tell, and we've begun to do so in the first year with the museum. The museum provided um, an awful lot of storytelling from locals, but the best thing of all it did was this little simple thing, which, you know, our, we had some volunteers and board members who had a long history with the festival to be able to address questions as to the move, or why did you book this versus that, and whatever happened to Noel Harrison, who played in 1977. But they were encouraged to sign a guest book. And where people come from and what they have to say, say speaks volumes. And what we do know is when people come from out of town, they've made a commitment beyond the rain. They're gonna be there anyways. Whereas the closer you're from, the easier it is to say we can go tomorrow. So weather aside, the museum was an absolute success. Just a few more positives, because the Festival of Friends, more than anything else, does remain a strong and positive event and organization. Again, this year we had over a thousand applications from musicians from all over North America. Our weekend, there was not a hotel room available in the city. That is the consistent case. We do not have um, an understanding of the impact of where people come from and how seriously they take the music offering we have. Although CBC did not come and broadcast, CNN did for Leon Russell. There was not the tweeting frenzy of look who's down here because nobody's coming um, to see Leon Russell in the rain when Leon Russell is playing from far and wide. We feel like there's some real chest beating that we are booking important artists that are bringing people from far and wide and camera crews from Atlanta. Our secondary stages 
we're a little hit and miss this year. In our first year in Ancaster, the children's area was all indoors. We thought that it was much more appropriate for children to be taking in the festival outdoors, and this year it washed away. The, it was a complete disaster. There was no children's area. However, the indoor stage, which is an intimate interactive um, stage presented in conjunction with the spectator reporters who serve as the Q&A, was as good as anything we've ever done. We are so proud that we book local acts who get massive exposure by having opening slots for international stars. We are so thrilled as an organization to be able to see and retain our volunteers on an annual basis. And contrary to all the scuttle we keep hearing, we remain completely committed to our mandate of keeping the festival free. There was an awful lot of lessons learned from our first year in Ancaster moving to the second. Um, issues in regards to um, knocking out the cell service with too many cell phones going, traffic tie-ins, um, improving the bus service. A lot of lessons learned were implemented. However, the rain really killed the crowds to be able to see how well that was achieved. Something has, has happened that is so wonderful for me, the festival and otherwise, that our relationships with City, working with Anna Bradford, Jennifer Kay, Bridget McIntosh has never been better. Working through the seed programs, um, being able to use City staff to facilitate access to HSR, we're as cool as we've ever been on that front. It's worth noting that the Festival of Friends has a good amount of festival chattels that we are thrilled to loan and do every year, whether it's our um, table umbrellas, tents, the trailers we use, um, to all kinds of events citywide, and it's our pleasure to do so because as long as your festival's not in our weekend and in our town, we're happy that you have a huge success too. There is no competition. So I stand before you guys this year thrilled to suggest we are not asking for an increase. However, as much as public safety remains our number one priority, we have taken our event and made it absolutely financially bulletproof with the exception to the one aspect shown in the graph. By no means are we um, pointing fingers and we have no issues with the police beyond the financial viability and our ability to be able to pay it. The Festival of Friends is too small of an organization we don't have any fat to cut. Yeah, I know, I thank you. That was a joke at me. There is a debt from last year, and it was a bad year. We closed our office and no one's getting paid. There's nothing else we can do, and we're not asking the city to fix that. What we're asking the city to do is moving forward, we need to have a financial formula that keeps us safe. And you can see how the police bill has, has taken an absolute uh, uh, chunk where otherwise it wasn't counted on before. Different events have different strengths and have different appeal in this city. And different events and festivals have different deals with the city of Hamilton. It is not our concern to be measured against um, whether it be a financial contribution or financial obligation. We can only stand here and ad advocate for ourselves while at the same time hoping that uh, everybody else manages well. 2008, we got destroyed with rain too. So the police bill and inability to pay can't be looked at as just in terms of a rain out. It could very well rain next year too. And the way it translates is we did between 10 and 15% of our in-park revenue. That means we were 85 to 90% down in attendance due to rain. We always have to plan for that possibility. If somebody knew what weekend it wouldn't rain, we would be happy to take place in that in that in that uh, time of August, but you never know, and and we know that going in. So, with all respect to to the police and and the good work they do for us, our specific request on uh, the second page there is that we would ask that we remain at the same level of funding, and because the police bill is not a line item that is stable ask that it be transferred to the city's domain, whether it ends up 
at culture or otherwise, from everything to the contract um, to the financial responsibility. I have no idea if that's viable, but I'm hoping that uh, it certainly can be. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate uh, the presentation. And for my council colleagues, it's under Hamilton Wentworth Creative Arts tab in your budget book. It was HWCA, in case you're looking. Thank you. And I'll move the speakers this way for Councillor Jackson and Councillor Ferguson. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. And um, Lauren, in spite of all the challenges, you still secured the bangles and you caught my interest. You got it. That's wonderful. Um, so, Lauren, um, first of all, thanks. Um, I see that, unlike last year, you have submitted an audited statement. Could I just ask you to comment, though, Lauren, uh, if you could, in sincerity, on your chartered accountant statement under qualified opinion. It says they were unable to obtain sufficient enough or appropriate enough evidence about the completeness on the sponsorship side and on the vendor side. Otherwise, with their qualified opinion, they said, uh, we approve of what we're submitting here. So maybe you could comment on their comment as to maybe what further information type of thing may be forthcoming in the future. Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Lauren, please. Absolutely. The financials are not nearly as bad as purported, and the qualification as it was explained by me, when we do cash in the park and a transaction occurs and it goes to the festival bank and we then pay, whether it's a supplier or a performer in cash, and many of the deals are, the auditor took 100% um, check mark to all expenditures paid with cash because we have the contract and we have uh, the receipt. The difficulty is the incoming of the cash is not fully auditable, whereas the parking was, some of the beer revenue was not. I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but th that's my understanding from Patinelli Master Luisi as to where the qualification comes from. So, Lauren, that explains the vendor's revenue side of it, and he also says sponsorships. I don't, I can't, I can't speak to that at all because every sponsor pays us with a check that goes in the bank. It is what it is. I'll leave that between you and your accountants yes, sir. moving forward to close that loop, hopefully, in the future. Uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, a comment to Lauren. Um, I'm on the... Um, Grants Committee chaired by Councillor Powers along with my uh, colleagues Johnson, Ferguson, uh, Duval um, that we serve on the Grants Committee and um, Lauren on the police side of things at least I'll speak for myself today I cannot promise you a waiving of that $7,500 bill but I can tell you that the I'm just reading here what he put about paying the 7500 to police services. So, so how much it, so to clarify, I got a lot of whispering going on and I need to right. clarify. Right, so we paid, you owe, uh, uh, um, we paid $7,500 to the police this year. Yes. That number came because it was the average of the police bills in the last 10 years of Gage Park. So the chart that is in there um, suggests so how much is owing then still to police, Lauren? Can you give me that amount, please? Uh, All park range? Uh, 25. 2500 or 1000 1000 1000 25000 okay. And that's with so the reduction far. due to rain. The contract position was just under 50. Okay, so thank you. And to my point then, Madam Deputy Mayor, the Grants Committee has heard from a number of organizations that are struggling with the police bills, uh, especially most of them volunteer-driven. And you basically are the one-man show now in light of your office announcement here. So, Madam Deputy Mayor, it's a work in progress through the Grants Committee. Um, and Councilor Marula, I apologize. Councilor Marula is on the Grants Committee as well. We're working through that, and we've actually asked at the last meeting for one of the executive team of the police, either Chief Decare or one of the two deputies, Gerd or Leanhurst, to attend to a future Grants meeting because the policing cost is something we need to understand as well because it has become quite onerous for many of our ethno-cultural groups, arts groups, festival groups in the community that are just saying it just seems to be policing costs getting out of control. So in theory, Lauren, I'm with you, but for me at least as one member of council today to say 
25 grand will be looked after. I can't give that commitment. So that's a work in progress. I just leave that thought with you, Lauren. And Lauren, last comment, you know your industry 500 times better than I ever will. So for rain dates, I guess unlike baseball games and things like that where you can have rain checks and things like that, you gear up all year for that particular weekend. Mother Nature does something unfavorable. But is there like a worst case scenario, best case scenario within your budgeting that somehow can absorb that? Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Lauren for a comment. Councillor, a few things in regards to that. Because we are not ticketed, there's really no metrics to get an insurance policy against the rain because we would be reimbursed for a giant question mark of lost revenues as opposed to ticket sales that would be refunded. What we do know in regards to rain is that certain music produces certain audiences who are more tolerant to mud and rain than others. So this year, um, we did an all-female night from Chantal Kreviazek into the Bangles. And without being stereotypical, that is the farthest end of the spectrum of who would stand in the rain and mud, um, as opposed to some real mean, dirty rock and roll who doesn't care. So a little bit, but I can't just book mud music. <laughs> Okay, well, I just leave the thought with you, yes, Lauren, sir. that, you know, the worst case scenario, best case scenario, and somehow within your budgeting, try to um, anticipate that moving forward in light of, unfortunately, the last few years, which seems to be a bit of a pattern, hopefully they'll change. So again, on the policing costs, Lauren, at least for myself today, that has not been looked after. I can't promise you mm -hmm. from myself that will be looked after, but Grants Committee, it's a work in progress. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Lauren, it's nice to see you out again. Good to see you, sir. And uh, I can tell there's a ward councillor. I, I, I stopped by the event all three days because of the... Was it Pink, Pink Floyd, you said? The no, no, Pink Floyd in 75. We recreated it with Sheepdogs and City and Colour. It, it was our, our, because of the, the sort of Pink Floyd comparison there on the Friday night uh, in 2011, um, I, I stopped by regularly just to get a handle on what's going on, and I could tell my members of council, it didn't rain, it poured, and it poured Friday night and all day Saturday, and I was, I come home covered in mud, and, uh, you know, I don't want a lot of revenue uh, that the Festival Fen relies on, based on my previous experience going in 2011, is on beer sales, and not only was it raining, it was freezing out, and... I just, nobody drinks beer in the rain when it's freezing out, and uh, that's a significant loss of revenue for them. But despite that, I'm pleased to see you're coming in at zero. You're following our guidelines, and, uh, and it's nice to see the audited statements. Yes, sir. Um, that was something that's been requested in the past, and uh, it's coming in now. Um, uh, but on the police side, um, to you, Madam Chairman, to Mike, Mike, uh, there was a report that came from staff to, as to Councillor Jackson uh, related to related to other festivals that re require police service. Uh, was it $114,000 that uh, the report came back from staff that um, festivals were billed for police services over and above the budget? Well, uh, you, <coughs> sorry, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, in terms of those agencies who receive funding through Grants. Community Partnership Program, the uh, actuals for 2012 are coming in $104,000 over and above what was budgeted in 2012. Okay, just refresh my memory. Did Grants Committee agree to uh, recommend to the Standing Committee that we pay that? I know we, I agree with Councillor Jackson, we're asking for a senior person from the HPS to come in and give us an explanation why there's this spike in there. Of course, seeing this with police on their on their budget request, and and now we're seeing it also uh, some upwards pressure on funding from uh, people who require police services for their event. Uh, what was the recommendation of Kamada Grants? Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, in 2012, uh, because of some anomalies in terms of agencies that historically received funding through 2000 or through CPP who didn't require the funding in 2012, there was some available funding some available balance of funding in 2012 in the CPP program, and therefore the uh, pressure of $104,000 was able to be offset through that available funding. Right, so Grants is recommending to the, to the appropriate standing committee, I think it's audit administration, that we pay it. For you, Madam Deputy Mayor, yes. Okay. And 
you know, I, I can understand where the police were coming from. We had some good spirited conversation with the police before the event started because of our experience on the Friday night. But that was uh, the perfect storm, however, the opposite kind of storm we experienced in 20, 2012, where it was a new location. Everybody wanted to see it. They had uh, uh, hay bailers or the sheep dogs. Had sheep dogs in sitting dogs. color. That's what the hay bailers. <laughs> Oh, well. It appeared on the front page of Rolling Stone magazine just before it, and they, you know, they were supposed to be a warm-up band, and we didn't have the intersection fixed at Wilson and Trinity, which has now been right. done. And, uh, the buses were trying to loop through the event, which is a disaster. We're now bringing them in the uh, exit off Wilson Street, staying away from the public. So we put all these corrective things in place, but there was a significant number of police. And at Grants, we had a conversation. Why can't these agencies inside the compounds... Certainly outside has got to be police, but inside use private contractors to perform security. And that's something further that uh, the Grants Committee will be exploring with the Hamilton Police Services when they come before us. Through you, Madam Chairman, to uh, Lauren, would you support that kind of thing where we would we, uh, switch to you hiring outside security? With all respect to the HPS, we do have private security. There is an, the, the police make it very clear they're not there to do security. They don't check IDs in the beer area. They, so to answer your direct question of can we police ourselves, the police say no. But they're not there to do any task for the event itself. They are there to observe and protect citizens, but they don't... They do not have a police presence in front of the stage to make sure that uh, nobody is going to rush the stage. We have we hire bouncers to do that. We they they don't work for us. They work for the general good at whatever level they book themselves. Okay, but through you again to Madam Chairman to Lauren. Could you provide, do you need police inside or can you do it with private contract? Um, a couple in case there's an issue that, yeah. Okay. And, of course, if the police want to put guns in gangs units or the undercover, that's up to them if they want to go in and, and uh, check that kind of thing. Okay, uh, I, I think the message here is that Grants is getting their head around this. I don't know if you have, do you have anything further to add on that, uh, Mike? For you, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, not specific to Grants, but we do have, staff do have an issue with respect to the next installment uh, scheduled uh, to be sent out to HWCA in February. Uh, Council approved in 2012 a policy uh, whereby if any external border agency um, is in arrears with respect to city or city services, that any approved grant funding, including advances, uh, be applied to that arrear until such time as that agency or board uh, is in a balanced uh, payment position uh, with the city. And so given that that is a policy and given that uh, the scheduled payments to HW, or sorry, scheduled advance to HWCA, the next one is scheduled for uh, February, uh, just in two, two weeks from now, uh, staff would, re would require committee and council to waive that policy if we were to advance the second of 12 installments to HWCA. So in terms of just the issue around advancing funding to HWCA, we would require that direction from committee and council. Uh, however, that still will not resolve the balance owing in, um, in December of 2012. We were uh, notified from uh, Hamilton Police Services that the balance owing was $34,126. I don't know what the uh, up-to-date balance is, but uh, again, as of uh, the end of 2012, it was $34,000. So again, uh, the issue is a policy whereby we cannot advance uh, payment to, these, uh, to this agency, uh, and we're looking for direction from committee. Okay, um, so through you, Madam Chair, and Mike, uh, in light of the, of the action that the um, Grants Committee took for all the other events like Santa Claus parades and so on for overrunning police costs, would you, uh, as our CFO, acting CFO, recommend to us then that we do waive it until this gets sorted out with grants with the police? And we can continue the installment payments until we get this sorted out? For you, Madam Deputy Mayor, one option uh, is to waive the policy and continue the installments to HWCA. Uh, the issue is that Hamilton Police Services is carrying the receivable. The city isn't uh, carrying the receivable. And so that uh, 34000 
dollars or less of receivables that's an issue that Hamilton Police Services is looking for some resolution uh, and if uh, the city uh, of Hamilton is uh, willing to offset that that receivable by providing funding to HPS that would be one option alternatively uh, another option is for this agency and HPS to continue to sit down and review the amount owing and try to come up to some resolution with respect to that receivable. Well, I, I suspect the latter, the, belt, the belly button is not going to continue. I think they're at an impasse is what I'm hearing. I'm, I also know the Grants is trying to get their head around this whole issue from a citywide perspective, not just Festival of Friends, that we do have Hamilton Police Services coming in. Uh, so is one option then we just... It wins the next installment due. <coughs> For you, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, I believe the next installment is due February the 1st. Okay, so next Friday then. And uh, so I, I'll just throw it out to my colleagues. It might be a suggestion that we continue with installment payments subject to a resolution of the policing issue, which you may want to refer to the Grants Committee to deal with it citywide and come back with a recommendation to com uh, a standing committee and ultimately council um, once we are able to have the police services in and talk globally rather than just each specific individual situation. I'm not suggesting for a second we waive it at this time, just that we continue with the installment payments until there's a resolution. I would suspect that, uh, and I'll ask him uh, to you, to Lauren, I suspect you're not uh, about, you're, you're going to be able to cut a deal with the police in this thing. You're going to rely on, on us as members of council to come to resolution of this? Yes, sir. And, and a couple things if I can add. We don't need just a resolution on the outstanding 2012 bill. Um, we need a resolution on how we deal with police moving forward. I don't mean to be salacious, but that chart really does show it all. Additionally, after the payment that we made, there is no mechanism set up for us to be able to negotiate with the police. When it rains, you're on the hook for four hours of policing, but the police were unable to bring the bill down on the police that were not in the park with us or on the street at the corner. As an example, Councillor, we paid for 13 hours a day as opposed to four hours a day for a dispatcher because if they weren't with us, the staff sergeant couldn't counsel them. There is no mechanism within the police service for us to be able to have that brought back and create a resolution on the outstanding or anything moving forward. So they said, uh, deal with the city. So here I am. Okay, and the reason there's a disconnect through, uh, through Mentor between your 25000 that's owing and Mike's $34,000 that's owing is because you've made a payment? Yeah, uh, yes, and the 7500 came from, that's a median amount of... of when was that paid, the 7500 About a month ago. Okay, that may be, uh, through Mentor Chairman to Mike, that may be the disconnect is that the, the police hadn't processed that one payment. No, Councillor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but they made it very clear that they would be seeking a garnishee order off of our city check. Yeah, but they may be doing the same with, the, with their budget, too. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. But, um, uh, I, so I, I can't make a motion at this time, Madam Chairman, but I would suggest we just continue with the payments until we're the Grants Committee take this on as part of everybody else and come to a global solution. Thank you. Councillor, I may have to come back to you then for a motion uh, once I complete the speaker's list. Councillor Pasito, then Councillor Partridge. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor Pearson, and I'm not going to belabor this. Lauren, and welcome. Question is why? Why do you not charge a, a ticket price, a fee, and have you considered it? Three, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. The, the clearest covenant that we have with the City of Hamilton is, and this isn't mine, this is from the beginning of time in 76. You, the city, give us money to entertain Hamiltonians for free. The, that is the way it's been and always been. The difficulty is I could make and you could make a strong argument for we could make a whole lot more money that way. We wouldn't be the Festival of Friends. There will be no Festival of Friends before it charges admission because that, that kills the um, non-elitist, everybody can, can participate in all the good stuff. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 
we got revenue in here parking. How does that come about? Who charges the parking and how do you... So our auditor accepted the parking because we don't um, we don't handle any of the park uh, excuse me any of the cash directly in the park we partner with another charity on that and our parking revenue is strictly um, via a check received from that partner. Yes. Okay. Um, just a little another question here. Then police services over the years at Gage Park. And then 2011, 2012, we've come to the Ancaster Fairgrounds, Council Ferguson's area. Has there been an increase in incidences over the years as far as police needing to respond? Do you have a record of that, sir? Or? We, um, we ask for police reports at, upon conclusion. There was not a single incident with, with police in 2012. There was a few in 2011. Um, However, we are significantly down, even on uh, um, our Friday night in 2011, was soft compared to big nights in Gage Park. Although the police bill has increased sevenfold, the police presence in the park is not quite, it, it has not increased sevenfold. It's just a different um, onus on us as to what we pay for versus what we used to pay for. And, and to be clear, Councillor, the Festival of Friends has grown over the last 10 years, not sevenfold. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Most of my uh, most of my questions have been asked and answered, um, so I, I appreciate the my colleagues um, uh, having that discussion. I'm going to uh, wait until Councillor Ferguson brings his motion forward. I will consider seconding it, but I'll like to make some comments on it at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, Lauren, thank you for the presentation, the information. Certainly, I know you work very hard in your committee on putting this event together every year, and I have to say, unfortunately, I did miss this year, and I know it rained because I was a wedding in, in Sturgeon Falls for the weekend, and it rained every day. Um, so, uh, And part of this wedding was an outside one, so it was very interesting, and I certainly had my thoughts and wishes that things were going better down in Hamilton. Um, but uh, on that, I do also want to mention there has been an issue, and I know I raised it at a previous meeting with regards to the charges for the uh, policing. I've had the complaints or the concerns come in from the Santa Claus Parade, Stony Creek Santa Claus Parade, uh, also concerns of going moving forward with the Canada Flag Day Festival. They've taken huge hits this year, and they're in the range of $7,000, $4,000, $3,000 as far as policing. And these are totally volunteer committees that do not. The only fundraising they do is sending out letters to uh, businesses and organizations and banks to see if they can contribute a little bit of money. And, you know, I've always stood by on the parade side that, you know, even with Canada Flag Day, you know, how many years it's been trying to instill in, in my council colleagues that they have to pay for the bands that come to these parades. And I think even just Burlington Teen Term Band is over $3,000 now. So it's a huge hit. This policing charge, road closures as far as uh, street events, also was a huge hit. And I know that's been sent back to the subcommittee uh, to look at. And it also suggested that these groups make presentation before GIC. Because it's unfortunate. I uh, hate to see us losing great volunteers. They're doing wonderful things for our community and providing venues for, for people to come out and enjoy. So uh, certainly hear you loud and clear, Lauren. And I'll be interested in hearing what the motion is coming forward. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Ferguson, I'm going to go to you. Okay, I'm just trying to craft it out here. Mike, it's you, Matt. <laughs> Mike, what, what's, what's the group called that Grant's dealt with? There's a acronym. What is it? It wasn't seat that you referred to, though, in your comments, Mike. So. For you, Madam Deputy Mayor, it was the Community, uh, community Partnership Program, CPP. Okay, I'd like to move that the city continue interim payments to Festival Friends until the city is able to resolve the issue of police costs for um, CC, CP, CPP for, uh, project and, and that the issue of uh, police overrun cost also be referred to Grants Committee to allow the city to deal with this um, citywide. Councillor, yes, Councillor Partridge seconding Councillor Ferguson's motion. Councillor Jackson on the motion. Just want to hear Councillor Ferguson just again clearly state now that the motion's on the floor. This is not assuming a waiving at this time of the Festival of Friends Festival Police Outstanding Costs. Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Councillor Ferguson. Absolutely. I, I just 
continue interim payments until we're able to get a resolution citywide. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Thank you. So with that, we have a motion. Councilor Parker, did you want to speak to it? Yes, I did. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And um, um, yes, hearing that, I'm absolutely pleased to second this. I know certainly within Waterdown with the uh, O Canada Rib Fest Day uh, Festival that's on for four days, um, and also with the uh, Santa Claus Parade that happens in November, the policing costs, uh, they're crippling these agencies and they're having great difficulty. But it's not just the policing costs, it's the, it's the whole CPP program in general. And it's my understanding that the Grants Review uh, committee is looking at reviewing that to try and make ongoing uh, grant applications a little bit um, uh, more compressed, if you will, and, and certainly more user-friendly for these groups. Because as you indicated yourself, Madam Deputy Mayor, it's, it's volunteers who run these events and a tremendous, tremendous amount of hours that they put into it. And we can't lose that. That's, uh, that's what makes our community what it is. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just had um, Mike whisper in my ear asking if we could have a friendly amendment to that uh, motion, Councillor Ferguson, is that we put a time period for 2013 so that it's not open-ended. So we look the at time the time frame when the correct, committee just, will resolve this? Correct. And, and that interim payments for 2013 only. 2012 that doesn't carry. Or, or 2013 correct. only. Correct. Yeah, okay. that's. Uh, I would hope we could fix this up before the yes. festivals all start up again. So Correct. Certainly, I'm but happy. But we want to be sure that it's in the record. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Councillor. Seconder agrees. Thank you. All in favor? Carrie. That is carried. We'll make sure Carolyn knows that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now we'll go on to uh, Hamilton Beach Rescue. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Very good, sir. Um, good morning, uh, Deputy Mayor, members of Council, and staff. For those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Mark Dean. I am Deputy Chief, as well as a member of the Board of Directors for the Hamilton Beach Rescue Unit. With me today, I have Lieutenant uh, Charlie Witherington, as well as Privates Chris Rowland and Ian McKellop. In the correspondence of October 11, 2012, boards and agencies were requested to submit requests based on a 0% guideline which our organization was able to follow as identified in our submission of November 19th, 2012. I have enclosed the uh, following for each of you. You have a request for the 2013 operating and capital grants. You have the 10-year capital replacement plan. You have an up-to-date history of the organization pamphlet. This outlines the commitment and dedication to the rescue unit of the rescue unit along Lake Ontario shoreline from the Ship Canal to Niagara Region Line at 50 Point as well as the Burlington Bay. You also have the training and response report for 2012. Over the years, the rescue unit has responded to many emergencies and are normally deployed, activated by the Hamilton Police Marine Unit, Fire Department, EMS or Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary, either from Trenton or, po or Prescott. Also, the lift bridge uh, operator at the uh, canal has identified emergencies in the canal, the bay or the lake, and phoned us directly. A recent newspaper article, police called in to Hamilton, called in Hamilton Beach Rescue Unit, which located a woman's body in the water. It took them less than 15 minutes from the time the call came in to arrive on scene. It took three of us to get her up onto the rocks, says Leon Buda, chief of the rescue unit, a volunteer group that provides a local police Coast Guard auxiliary with marine assistance from the spectator. In 2012, through our fundraising efforts, we were able to replace an aging 25-foot Stanley with a new 25-foot Stanley vessel equipped with up-to-date navigation electronics, twin 150 horsepower motors, as well as a trailer at a cost of over $125,000. In 2012, we participated in boating safety days at Leander Boat Club. We have continued to participate in the Stony Creek and Waterdown Christmas parades, as well as the polar bear swim off Hutches, promoting water safety. Late in 2009, a surplus ambulance was acquired from EMS. 
It was refurbished and is now known as Rescue 2, a support and tow vessel or vehicle for assisting the police, fire, and EMS when required. The support vehicle is equipped with floater suits, survival suits, ice rescue gear, backboard, rings, and other items that will assist us in, in performing our job. Rescue 2 is a great addition to the vehicle or to the vehicles we already and the resources we already have. Additional funding was also received from the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary of $3,000 and private donations of $450. In closing, the rescue unit would respectfully request consideration for our 2013 budget in order to continue to serve our community and assist the police, EMS, at any emergency in the city. Thank you, and now on to our slide presentation. The organization started in 1958, and we have over 50 years of continuous service to the community. Our heritage, Jeep and boats from the 1960s in front of our old tired storage building, which was built in 1970. Our history has been included in your package. This is the uh, new boat storage building completed in 2008. Twenty-two foot limestone and twenty-five foot savior stored safely in a new, store, new boat storage building. Both vessels are now equipped with automated external defibrillators, AED units. Our new 25 foot Stanley rescue vessel was purchased for over $125,000 to replace the 2000 vessel. The entire funds were raised through our fundraising with no impact on city capital funds. The new Savior, equipped and ready for any emergencies. It's powered by twin 150 horse Yamaha motors, great for rescues in Lake Ontario. Our Tahoe and Limestone, ready to be launched in a moment's notice. This is the new Savior on patrol. Our patrol is run from June to September, Saturday, Sunday, and holiday Mondays. We are also available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Rescue unit at work assisting the Hamilton Marine Police in putting out a fire on a vessel. This is the new Savior and her crew training on victim recovery. Again, our crew training on victory recovery and first aid at the canal. This is the rescue unit assisting the police during the Red Hill QEW flooding with closing the highway and assisting motorists. A disabled pleasure craft being towed into Safe Harbor. A limestone towing a disabled sailboat through the ship canal, taking her back to safety. This is a limestone and her crew meeting with the Hamilton Marine Unit on Lake Ontario, discussing a patrol pattern. This is our 18-foot Zodiac purchased in 2008 for rescues in the waters in the Hamilton area and ice rescues. This is the Savior and the Limestone answering an emergency call. This is the Limestone training with the Canadian Coast Guard helicopter on victim removal. We are also going to uh, continue with some more training with Kassar out of Niagara Falls um, early in this spring. This is the flood on National Street in Hamilton's East End. Unit members were called to assist with their equipment in the rescue efforts of people, pets, on the day of the flood. Our two 12-foot aluminums were used in this rescue. 
There are members assisting in the search out for Angus. Again, assisting in the search out for Angus. Rescue unit assisting the Hamilton police with victim recovery at the high level bridge over the last summer. This is our unit members standing by the January 1st polar bear swim at Van Wagner's Beach. Again, us at the polar bear swim, ready for our services. This is members participating in ice rescue training on the Hamilton Bay. This is down in the CCIW or CCW area there. Again, members participating in ice rescue training. This is how much ice we had uh, last year, a year and a half ago. Some more ice rescue training. This picture is a little older, but I wanted to stress what the ice can be like in Hamilton. Members of our unit at a mock rescue training ex exercise on the pond across from Hutches. And again, members of our unit training for any emergencies on the ice flows. This is rescue two, geared with first aid equipment, ropes, blankets, shuttle sled, rescue helmets, ice owls, and dry suits. And this is our members uh, promoting boating safety at the Stony Creek Christmas Parade. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mark. Excellent presentation as always. And uh, great to see you here with your, your team. And uh, certainly appreciate all the work that goes into uh, the volunteer services that you provide to the city. Councillor Collins, you wish to ask a question? No, I have no question, Mr. Chairman, but I did want to thank uh, Mark and his members as every year they come in. And, and as we all know, they have a very long history of serving the community, both in and out of the water. And I know, you know what Mark's emphasized today here is, is certainly what they, they do in terms of their ex rescue operations. And I had the, the privilege of going out for a night in October, late October, and took a tour of the harbour with some of their members. And it's a very high-skilled, uh, um, a very high-tech uh, environment uh, that they work in. And, uh, and they're out there, um, certainly in what looks like uh, nice weather on a day like uh, the picture shows here. But they're also out there in freezing cold temperatures, as you noted in some of the other photos. And, and they're also out on the water in, in very rough conditions. And so they, uh, at times, are putting their own, own lives on the line to help others. And uh, I think we, we certainly owe them a, a great deal of, uh, of thanks in, in terms of all that they do. And, and all of this, as I said earlier, they're volunteering their time. They don't get paid for this. There's no honorarium that comes with this. This is strictly for the good of the community. And, um, and they do so much, uh, not just for, as I said, in the water, but as noted, you know, they're participating in community events. They've opened the doors at their rescue unit for uh, community organizations free of charge to do good, good things for the community. And uh, that's all part of being a great neighbor. And so I, I wanted to thank them individually and, and as a group for all that they've done and all that they continue, continue to do for the city. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Councillor Collins couldn't have put it any better, and certainly being the ward councillor in that area absolutely has a, a true understanding of the history and everything that you do. Um, I'm going to ask one question, and it's just because of seeing, every year we see terrific presentations. Are there any opportunities that you've ever had when you do your rescues out on the water, like you had disabled vehicles, that you have any donations or contributions to come in? Yes, we have, and that shows in the uh, $450 that we Perfect. put in our budget that we've taken in, uh, along with the, uh, the Coast Guard, right? And when we go for the Coast Guard, they also pay us, and we put that in with our budget as well. I appreciate that, and I wanted it to be known because sometimes we miss line items, and I think it's important to understand and certainly appreciate that there are opportunities that you have, and, and it may not be great, but every little bit does help, and that, that's wonderful. Thank you again. Seeing no other questions? Did you have a question? No. Seeing no other questions? Super job again. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. And now we'll move on to Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra.
Um, thank you so much, Leslie, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, Councillors. My name is Carol Kehoe, and I am the Executive Director of the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra. And I wanted you to hear what our orchestra does every year based on everything that this community does for us. Leslie is our principal flautist. She's well regarded nationally and internationally, and I am thrilled that she was here today before she has to race off to Toronto for another performance. Um, so thank you, Leslie. Um, just so you know, I've been in this position since September. I haven't had the opportunity to meet many of you, so I apologize for that. It's been a short window of time. It's actually four months today that I am uh, living in Hamilton, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I don't have 25 years of history, but that is an advantage as well because I don't have anything but to look forward to. And looking forward is very, very bright coming to Hamilton and working with this organization. It's not a one-man show at the HPO. Here today, I have my board chair, Joy Grayhack, my vice chair, Bob Savage, my secretary of the board, Dermot Nolan, board members, John Hertel, Lou Chelly. I have my colleagues, Jerry Cousteau, Heather Hollis. I have a personnel manager and our French horn player in the orchestra, Neil Spalding. I have the ED of the Hamilton uh, Philharmonic Youth Orchestra, Diana Weir. And finally, and not least of all, our composer in residence, Abby Richardson Schulte. So thank you all for joining me today. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to just uh, reinforce for you the value of our orchestra to the community. Um, you can see, um, whoops, wrong way. You can see through our uh, presentation to you that we are coming in at a zero percent as well. Uh, we're not asking for any more this year as a, uh, was requested. We've provided our audited statements for last year. And uh, I just wanted to remind you that our orchestra is led by Jamie Somerville, who is our music director. Uh, Jamie is... Um, well regarded. He's been with us for six years. Six to eight years is about what a music director stays with an orchestra and uh, so we're very fortunate still to have him. Uh, he has inspired our musicians to play the most wonderful orchestra work that they can and every time there is a performance at Hamilton Place which is our uh, venue uh, you can see the results in the audience appreciation. Uh, they are, they just love what they're hearing because of the quality of the presentation from our orchestra. We have 32 musicians who are core. We bring up to 60 musicians in a year for 100 additional to, um, to uh, um, round out the season in terms of our performances. And that was when Leslie was going to play. I switched the order so I could be sure that she would uh, be able to get to Toronto. Our attendance is holding stable. We're up over, la over the previous year by about 1,000 people or 1,000 visits. Um, our subscribers are stable. Um, we have done a canvas of the postal codes and realized that there is representation in our audience base from all wards in the city. And I think that's a really important thing to remember, that uh, sometimes we have an idea that this is an elitist um, or uh, is only uh, that what we do as a, an art form is only appealing to a certain group of people and that's just not true. Uh, we appeal to a wide diversity of people and we are interested in increasing that over the next year. Um, you can see by the numbers that uh, we pay out in any given year about 550000 in salaries to musicians and about 100000 or over to HECFI. Um, one of the things that uh, I did want to emphasize for you is education is extremely important to what we do as an organization. We do have a robust education program, both Abby and Neil are involved in it and Diana. Uh, our musicians are mentors in the communities, they're coaches, they are people who allow uh, young people to learn about uh, what it is to be a music, a musician and an appreciator of music. And uh, they provide, that they are the faculty for the Hamilton Youth Orchestra uh, uh, and also uh, for other orchestras here in the, in the community. Um, this year, I, I'm not going to belabor what we did last year. Every year, we have terrific uh, musician soloists who come with the, uh, to us at the to play with the orchestra. Last year, we had James Ennis, 
Um, and this year we are going to be seeing Diana Panton, who is a local jazz musician, play with us on February 9th. We have our What Next Festival that is uh, scheduled for April. We are looking at a lot more community partnerships. We've uh, just initiated one with Volunteer Hamilton. We will be celebrating the work of volunteers by uh, making available tickets for uh, their member agency volunteers to come to the orchestra concerts throughout 2013. Uh, we are partnering with the Hamilton Yacht Club uh, for the Hamilton Philharmonic Race, the Cup Race, that will be taking place in July. It's a, a nice way for us to get out in the summertime and be available. And we'll do our holiday Christmas concert this year with the Children's Festival, or excuse me, the Children's Choir and the HPYO. I think that's it. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, do I have any questions? Council Jackson. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Nice to meet you, Carol. And Thank you. Welcome to Hamilton. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to see the um, increased uh, activity of the HPO in light of uh, a number of years ago uh, where it was somewhat stagnant and needed some rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a Dermot Nolan on your board, you're doing exceedingly well. I so. must say, I agree. <laughs> Is that okay, Dermot? Thank you. All right. <laughs> Uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, question as well to the uh, HPO, uh, Canada Council, Ontario Arts Council, are you mm -hmm. holding your own as well? Can you mm -hmm. possibly give us some mm -hmm. elaboration or update on that, Carol? Madam Deputy Mayor, through you, please. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, to what Louise was saying and to the others. We are in the same three-year cycle at both Canada Council and the Ontario Arts Council, and uh, we, have e we have seen stable numbers from both those agencies over the last few years. I've been in discussions with both. I'm not anticipating any, any changes that might be because of us. There may be other directives from the province or the federal government, but we've been assured that there will be stable funding. I think what's interesting and we didn't elaborate on is our we had a very good year in two, 2012. Um, orchestras Canada, which we're a member of, monitors 61 orchestras across the, professional orchestras across the country. We rank 22 in terms of revenue coming in. So we're 22 out of 61 across the country. What's interesting, in 2012, only 25 of those orchestras of the 61 uh, finished in the black. We were one of them. Uh, and I think that's a testament to our board of directors last year who really took it upon themselves to analyze the funding that comes to our orchestra. We get a third, a third, a third. That's pretty much what we look at. A third from government, uh, a third from corporate and individual donors, and then a third from our own revenue generation. We've identified we, where we need to grow and what we as an organization needs to take responsibility for and that's what we'll be working on for 2013 through 15. Well Carol that's to be celebrated. Congratulations mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. financial end of it to be one of the third in the black and and very much appreciated uh, honoring the objective of City Council this year with the zero percent as well mm -hmm. recognizing our municipalities challenges with ability to pay in that as well. The youth program um, is is inspiring me. Um, tell me, is it at all levels, elementary, high, post-secondary, that the classroom visits and the engagement occurs and the mentoring, or is it more focused in one particular uh, category? Madam Deputy Mayor, through you, please, Carol. I'm glad you asked that. It is all ages. And our goal by 2015 is that it will be even more than just education for children. Uh, education and active continued learning happens at all ages, and it would be our vision that there would be programs for seniors, that there would be programs for uh, retirement recent retirees um, and we're starting to build those as part of what we'd like to do but absolutely we are in the classrooms at the elementary school level the secondary school level Abby for example is currently working on a program where we have secondary school students who are composing music that we're going to premiere at the what next festival uh, we've got uh, and then we have uh, master classes that we do at the college and university level with some um, with uh, higher uh, level uh, musicians. Exciting times at the HPO. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, Thank Carol. You. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Partridge. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Carol, welcome. Thank Very you. Very nice to, uh, to meet you and, mm -hmm. and to have you here. I appreciate it. Just a couple of um, 
uh, quick questions. In, in your uh, financials, you have the uh, grant from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Mm -hmm. What's that for? Uh, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, that is a final, that what you are seeing there is a final grant, and they were, um, they gave us uh, funding to be able to support 16 musicians. All right, thank you. That's uh, that's excellent. And did I understand you correctly? This is the final year for yes. that grant. Yes, we're making another application for March first. Okay, excellent. That, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> so you, you folks are right on top of that. I, I appreciate it. I'm just I'm just wondering, um, and, and thank uh, Councillor Jackson for asking the questions on the on the youth program because mm -hmm. I too find that um, you know just just very inspiring to see uh, the HPO working with youth, and and my question. Question is: Are you currently? Is the organization currently working with anti, any um, disadvantaged youth programs out in the community, donating musical instruments for youth musical instruments, um, anything along that lines? I'm wondering if you could expand on that at all, or if you've mm -hmm. been considering it. Um, I think yes. It's uh, important to know that a couple of years ago, the Instrument for Every Child program was initiated through our organization. And so what happened was uh, Astrid Hepner, who's working on it currently, um, had come to the HPO and we collaborated, excuse me, collaborated together to figure out how this program could actually become uh, a real program. And we're delighted because, of course, now it is a real program that's being administered through Astrid's group. And they are facilitating a lot of what you were just talking about, making sure that children have access to instruments. Uh, we have an ongoing partnership with Astrid and we'll be looking forward to continuing to support those efforts. Well, knowing that Astrid's involved, I'm just <laughs> delighted. She is actually one of the uh, professors for my son mm -hmm. who's working on his music degree, and she is an amazing lady, as is Darcy. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. That's, those are my comments. But again, thank you so much for everything that you do. You're, you're truly a, a treasure and, and a jewel in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can't say it any better. Excellent presentation. Pleased to see the zero budget line. I'm sorry, Councillor Farr, I didn't see your hand go up earlier. My apologies. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You could finish and then I'll... That's fine. <laughs> okay, ahead. sorry about that, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Carol, good to see you again. Thank you, Jim. And uh, congratulations on your four months anniversary here. <laughs> I'm about to give you a little hammer time initiation, I think, but uh -oh. I'm sure you're going to stick handle around it uh, quite nicely. And it's uh, not exactly, it's the, I want to ask you a question about the Arts Funding Task Force, and this is an ongoing yeah. uh, task force initiative mm -hmm. uh, of which this council gets its second report on, I believe, in April or April. May. April? It's May. Actually, it's May, I believe. May. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See, you are already uh, doing well. Um, and uh, I know it's something you're obviously aware of with respect to this and, and, and with some of the other presentations, not necessarily the uh, elephant in the room, but uh, not a flautist in the room either, Madam Deputy Mayor. It's something that I think it's uh, due to uh, have as part of our conversation today um, because the ramifications obviously could, mm -hmm. uh, could be... Um, well, it could be actually a good news story in the end if it goes the way I hope it does, uh, given where we uh, place funding comparatively to other uh, markets mm -hmm. like ours. So, uh, in, in your perspective, um, and knowing that this is a, sort of a, a um, arts uh, advisory commission mm -hmm. sort of a led initiative reporting mm -hmm. to council, have you had discussions on it? Uh, where do you feel we are at? on it and have you been able to offer anything to that discussion and to that study given your financials here today through you madam deputy mayor um, thank you uh, yes to all of your questions I've had meetings with Christine, who's the chair of the task force. I've been talking with other, uh, Trisha LeClaire, who's the commission uh, chair, I understand, of the Arts Advisory Commission. And I was recently invited to and have agreed to sit on the arts, uh, arts task force. Wait, arts? Advisory Thank commission. you. <laughs> Not the, the commission. Arts, I'm going to be sitting. Network. That's the one. I'm, I'm going to be sitting on that for the for the last leg of it um, um, because I've uh, I've had some experience with this in terms of, um, of of positioning of funding at the municipal level, and I think that I'm I'm looking forward to being able to contribute to it. It's very important. It's a, it's a great it's a, it's a great opportunity at this time for the community. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's that's significant. I think that's good to hear. Uh, and your your experience is through you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. 
Um, when I was in London, I sat uh, for the municipality on the Creative City Task Force, which created the Creative City roadmap for like the 83 recommendations for the development of their cultural plan, all of those kinds of things, and was also part of the task force that um, contributed to uh, municipal funding for arts and culture in the City of London. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, uh, that's that's fantastic mm -hmm. that you'll be contributing, and uh, and you're, you being only here for just a few uh, months. Uh, Boris Brott mentioned earlier in his presentation that he had wished that they could continue to perform more at uh, Hamilton Place, mm -hmm. but the rents uh, have, have, get, have gotten a little mm -hmm. out of control over recent years. Uh, certainly, the HPO uh, feels that uh, <laughs> feels that hit as well, and. Um, Boris also mentioned that it's uh, uh, in 76 was dubbed the theater built by the people for the people. Mm -hmm. We have obviously a new operator coming in in global spectrum. It's not uh, the I's are not dotted, the T's are not crossed as of yet, but council has voted I think unanimously to to bring them in and manage Hamilton Place, manage Cops Coliseum, mm -hmm. in this case Hamilton Place. Have you had an opportunity to have a discussion or discussions with global spectrum and uh, what would they entail with respect to particularly uh, the rent situation that's affected yours and other organizations that want to use this world-class, first-class facility through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I've had preliminary discussions with Global Spectrum and the, and the individuals who will be working with them. Um, I, I don't think that, I think it's premature for me to talk about rents and everything else. I mean, those are business decisions that I think are going to be coming along the line. Um, I'm encouraged, very encouraged by the discussions that I'm having with both the current management and the upcoming management um, for Hamilton Place. And uh, to the respect of rents, um, I, I can only tell you that the value that we have received from Hamilton Place for the price point we're paying is excellent. So I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you that it's too much. I think that they have worked with us in such a fair and collaborative way and have assisted us in so many places to be able to do the work we do. I, I'm not sure that I would put it in a negative position. Well that's good to hear too. You referred to HECFI and as it exists mm -hmm. now. Um, I think that's probably it for now. I, I do look forward to uh, your contributions and hearing uh, from you and others with respect to the arts funding uh, task force. It's okay. certainly significant and important to all of us. Uh, and, and, and just on that last point, I do remember, I recall more of a statement than a question, but I do recall the conversation was had amongst this body, this council, with respect to when we first initiated Council Marula's initiation of getting a private operator, or two in this case for our three facilities um, to respect uh, that original mandate that Boris alluded to a little bit earlier with respect to uh, it, uh, it is a people place, Hamilton Place is significant and that we need to support uh, those local uh, groups uh, going forward and it's something that Global Spectrum would have heard, I imagine, given that we had the conversation here through the negotiation process that at, at least some uh, percentage, some portion of our, of our um, entertainment that comes in the future with them as managers will respect that uh, 1976 uh, proclamation, for lack of a better word. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Carol, I really look Thank forward you. to working with you. Hopefully Thank we can uh, have some uh, meetings with uh, some of the reps from the AAC real soon. So Terrific. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Well said, well answered, and uh, thank you for the presentation today and the uh, musical interlude. Thank you. We're going to move on now to Opera Hamilton. today. Great. 
Good morning. Madam Deputy Chair, Council Members, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm just going to, I'm, not, I'm going to, uh, seeing as there's quite familiar faces around the table, I'm not going to spend a long time on history. Uh, we are in our 33rd season, having originated out of Fest Italia many, many years ago. Um, we have uh, a tremendous reputation for regional opera, and as such, our mandate is the uh, promotion and hiring and, of uh, young Canadian artists at all levels. It um, affords us a unique place where we have people at all stages of their career performing in our productions. So for many people, this may be their first opportunity to perform a major role, uh, and then they come back many years later to kind of thank us for that, and so we end up with seasoned veterans as well as people just coming out of school as well. Um, so you get quite a, quite a cast, quite a variety, and uh, at the same time we're providing opportunities for Canadians all over the place. We are one of the only two professional opera companies in Ontario outside of Toronto. The other one's in Ottawa. Um, so it's, a, it's, as you all know, opera being the most expensive art form that there is. Um, it's uh, at a great cost to put on productions because it involves so many different aspects. Um, our more recent history, as you know, a couple of years ago we came before you and, and uh, mentioned our concerns with uh, being in Hamilton Place in terms of our costs, and uh, we moved to the DeFasco Center for the Arts, which is Theatre Aquarius. We prevent, uh, present uh, four performances for each of the two staged, fully staged operas that we do and Popra. We have about 8,000 people go through in a year. And uh, we have our education program that has a number of different levels to it. Uh, for the older uh, kids, we have a Young People's Night at the Opera, which is our dress rehearsal. And that's um, primarily, sometimes elementary, mostly secondary, and quite a lot of homeschool, actually. The majority, I would say, of our audience that comes to the Young People's Night at the Opera is actually homeschooled. Um, the mix of whether it's elementary or secondary depends on the subject matter of the opera. Um, sometimes it's not appropriate for young children. We have, uh, we have, <clears throat> and then we have a, a partnership, much like many corporations are linked with specific schools in the uh, Hamilton Board of Education. We are linked specifically with Buchanan Park School, and they have an opera program as well. And when we have guest artists in town, our uh, channel director, David Spears, and some of the guest artists will go out and talk at, uh, to the various kids at the schools. And uh, we have our um, different components, and, and we're hoping now that we're in Theater Aquarius, which is a, a, a much more intimate space that at some point in the near future we'll be able to start having more education programs in the theater during the daytime. Um, Currently, uh, we've all, uh, our season this year at the Tafasco Center, we've already done Rigoletto, which was in uh, October. And we just finished Papa last week, Papa being our best of concert with the, the orchestra on stage and the soloists in front and just singing everyone's favorite tunes that they, they recognize. And we still have yet to go Pearl Fishers, which is happening in March, which you're all invited to come to. Any production that we have, any time, all the time, uh, be happy to see you there. Um, Briefly, historically, financially, six years ago we had uh, a bit of a hit a wall and the deficit had grown to 1.6 million with the support of the different uh, levels of corporations and governments and the, and the patrons we got the deficit down to 247. Returned to a full season about five years ago and the attendance and support was growing steadily. However, our costs at, at Hamilton Place kept growing and growing and, and it became apparent that we could no longer stay there and survive, uh, making our relocation to uh, the DeFasco Center essential. In our new home, uh, we've seen our production costs drop dramatically, um, both uh, in the preferred rent that we get from them and also in the um, the, the crew that works there. It's just an incredible crew. They, they work 
to look at every aspect of what we do and assist us in terms of making things more efficient and run smoothly and, and it's, it's their house, they know how it runs and they have some great ideas and they're always eager to help us out. So overall, last year in 11-12 in that you have the audited statements for, uh, we went from the previous year of having a deficit of 278000 in our last year at Hamilton Place to having a surplus of $70,000 at the FASCO Center. That's our first operating surplus in about 22 years. Um, it was a combination of reducing our expenses by 200000 and increasing our fundraising by 155000 which represents overall a change of about 350,000 in our budget, which is about 30% of our budget. Um, in addition, this past year, one of those instances that where you think it's going to be a disaster, but it turns out a lot better. Um, the, our administrative offices, the building we were in, got sold. Uh, the new owners decided that they wanted to uh, demolish the, the main floor and take it over for themselves, and so we had about 35, 40 days notice to get out and find a new office. The good news is, which of course wasn't in the budget, um, the good news is that we found a new place that's on Jackson Street, closer to the to the, our performing space, and it's half the rent. Uh, it's a nice space in an old Victorian semi. Uh, the other half is Vince Agro. Um, and so it's a very, that was a, a, a good cost savings that happened along the, along the way. So as a result, as I mentioned, uh, for 2011-12, we had a surplus of 70000 Our commitment to you and the provincial and the federal governments by our board is that we are going to continue to have surpluses of between fifty dollars and $70,000 each season to reduce our accumulated deficit. We're going to, we've, we've found over the, the refining of the budget over the last two years, uh, since moving from Hamilton Place, we found the, the template that we want to work with that will allow us to do that. We're going to stick with that budget for a number of years. It's a, it's a bit of a, uh, a sparse budget for um, maintaining an opera of this size. I mean, typically, a regional opera company of this size would spend Three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars per production, and we're doing it on about two fifty. Um, we used to have sixteen to eighteen staff; we have four, so we're kind of going along at bare bones at this point, and we will continue to do so until we eradicate more of the uh, accumulated deficit. But I'm happy to say that this year. Um, we are moving along with our fundraising at a pace that is similar to last year, but we have a large individual donation that's coming in that will allow us to kind of leap ahead with some of our goals, and we anticipate actually having a surplus of about 100000 or more uh, by the end of this year. So. The year before last, our accumulated deficit when we were in Hamilton Place the last year got up to 721,000. We've reduced it to 652, and we're on track to reduce it further to 552 by this year. And as I said, we're going to continue to chip away at that. Um, and using the established uh, template that we had uh, established in the previous two years to get to our deficit reduction goals, which was an official plan we submitted to the province and the federal government. However, 2012 was not without its challenges. Just as we had our first surplus in many years, um, things across the country were not, as, were, were not quite as rosy for some other groups. Uh, for 32 years, the province and the federal government has funded us in one particular method in that they would give us our annual grant all in the summertime, all before our first production. This year, at the meeting, with no notice, um, and due to, as I said, external circumstances elsewhere in Canada, being the opera company in uh, Ottawa only did one production last year and then shut down for the rest of the year. Vancouver Playhouse, arguably one of the largest theater companies in Canada, is gone completely. Um, so the provincial and federal governments changed our funding pattern to uh, spread the payments out throughout the year. 
As a result of that, we, went, we began our season with about $145,000 less in our cash flow than we had in previous years, just due to the timing change. We still, at this point, in January, have $90,000 yet to come in the next two months from these different levels of government as they spread it out. They have to have it all done by the end of March, which is their year end, but they've spread it out throughout the year. That tends to work well for arts organizations that have many performances, like uh, if it's theater and it's spread out through the year, or it's symphonies that spread out through the year, that's not a bad way to fund it. But for operas, where we spend our entire budget in three small clumps at different points of the year, it makes our cash flow extremely difficult. And um, we've had to test uh, the patience of many people, many of our partners in the community, and made alternative arrangements with other major partners in the community. But we will have a surplus this year, and we will operate this year and continue to operate on a uh, positive cash flow basis. Um, let's see. The board re rejuvenation that I talked a little bit about last year is continuing. Um, the nature of the beast being that we're in Hamilton and we have people who come on the board because they're from Hamilton and they're, and they're prominent in the community and then sometimes because of the nature of the beast they get transferred or they get a, a promotion somewhere else. So at the current time we have a few board members that are working in Toronto, some who live in Hamilton and commute every day and some who are now living and working in Toronto. Our focus is to getting more board members who live and work in Hamilton and we're moving along in that direction. Obviously it's a lot easier to go out and search for board members when you have a surplus operating def uh, budget than if you have a deficit. We hope to be, right now, we were at 10, we we're down to 9, we hope to be at uh, 12 to 14, which is the optimum recommended by a provincial study that was done for us um, by 2014. It'll, it doesn't sound like much to add a couple of people, except that we have some people who have been on the board through thick and thin for a long time. So as we replace, when we get new board members on, some will drop off and then we can get up to the full complement that we're looking for by 2014. Uh, support from the community is very strong. They love the new venue. They love the Sunday matinee, uh, the Saturday matinee rather. Um, there is obviously a particular demographic that doesn't like to drive at night um, and they are packing the place on Saturday afternoon. They also like the fact that we're across from the police station. That gives them a, a sense of security. Um, our average cost per order is steady. It went up uh, last year when we moved into the new uh, facility at DeFasco. Uh, so this year's numbers will look the same. Uh, fundraising, as I said, we're about almost bang on the same numbers where we were at this point last year, excluding the major gift that's coming. Um, we feel there's some increasing corporate opportunity with some of the new businesses that are looking to open in, in Hamilton. And uh, with the five months remaining, we will not only meet but surpass our budget objective. I think in, in the budget that you've got in front of you, it looks at about a $52,000 uh, surplus for this year. And uh, in fact, we'll be closer, if not over 100000 um, This is the budget for 13-14, the upcoming year. Um, we used to be, as Carol mentioned, for orchestras, it used to be a third, a third, and a third in terms of earned revenue donations and government support. But as you can see, our um, donated support, or donations, is what we're relying a lot more on. Uh, a lot more heavily than the other the other two areas. In terms of government support, um, our government, our provincial and our federal grants did go down slightly. More as a function, it's, it's kind of a catch-22. Um, they tell us to trim and fix our budgets, and then as our budgets get lower, they say, "Well, we're too high a percentage of your budget, so we're going to cut your deficit. You're going to cut your grant because now you have a lower budget." So. Six of one, half a dozen the other. Um, the uh, production expenses, all those expenses are remaining static at around the 1.1, a little over that, and we're increasing our revenue to 1.2 to give us a projected surplus of 72 for the <coughs> upcoming year. So for us, 13 14 starts in September of 13. Um, and the 13 14 season. 
We'll see the first production is Falstaff, which is a, a comic opera. It's never been presented in Hamilton before, so we uh, expect some great things with that. Uh, our annual Papa Plus in January, and then Carmen returns. We haven't had Carmen here. It'll be 10 seasons since we presented to Carmen, which is obviously a very popular opera, and we expect uh, very good single ticket sales for that, as well as for subscriptions. And uh, that's about everything I have for today. Thank you very much, Stephen. Excellent presentation. And um, I'm going to go now to speakers as I have Councillor Farrar, Councillor Jackson. Uh, actually, Stephen, thank you for Hi. being here. Sorry about that. Bernie just smells so good right now. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Madam Deputy Mayor, actually, Stephen answered my one question. The other would just be a housekeeping issue, and I'm not normally, not even close to being a stickler on this kind of thing, but in our budget book, you're using an old template, and it says at the bottom of the first page, and I only do this because I'm a proud uh, member of the Theatre Aquarius Board, and you obviously noted on a few occasions the many accolades of being in your new digs. Absolutely. So it just says uh, each season opera Hamilton produces three full stage operas, which you continue to do, and one concert presentation at Hamilton Place. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I don't normally uh, call, I could have taken you aside, but I, I did note that uh, you had mentioned on a few occasions that not only yourself and the executive and, and the board uh, like the new uh, location, Absolutely. we like having you, and also your patrons quite obviously yeah. enjoy the new location. So it's let's uh, promote it wherever possible, even in these big budget books. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And great presentation. Thank you. Thank Glad you. to hear the deficit is uh, reducing. We're working at it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Councillor Jackson, then. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. And um, about five, six years ago, um, Stephen, uh, when representatives from Opera Hamilton came in, we were at the convention center, and I try to, when I offer any criticism, I try to always make it constructive if, po if possible. I must admit I was, I think, along with the overwhelming majority of council, taken aback with uh, a last-minute dropping in our lap. I think, if I recall correctly, about a half a million dollar request to get you out of a severe deficit situation. So. Fast forward six years, congratulations, tremendous improvement and on the road to recovery and encouraging numbers most definitely. So uh, well done, Stephen, in that regards and to uh, David. Um, the Canada Arts and uh, Ontario Provincial Arts Councils and Canada Council, so I hear that payment dilemma. Is there an umbrella organization provincially, nationally, that you could join or have joined that could help lobby, advocate to maybe go back to the traditional payment that as you made the uh, very eloquent distinction between your performances two, three, four times a year versus the ongoing of other performing arts groups. Is there that kind of opportunity to possibly speak with federal provincial representatives to yeah. go back to the traditional payment? Madam Deputy Mayor, through you please to speak. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, there is a group called Opera Canada, which we belong to, and they are talking to them about making it a... a more level playing field for us and recognizing the special type of production that we do. Um, some of the other groups it's not as much of an issue because they do a lot more productions than we do so they end up being throughout the year. Uh, the two major companies actually come under a different funding group than we do. There's the, the two big guys and then uh, the, the rest of us regional operas are, are together. But yes, we, we do belong to the group and we are talking to them about how, how we fix this. Um, I, I know it was their wish that basically the whole point of this exercise was to bring us up to speed so we're not always using this year's grants to pay last year's bills. Um, they've kind of taken it the other way now to the point where now they're not looking at giving us some, some of the money until after the show is over. So it's basically prove to us you can do it and then we'll give you the money. So we, we need to find somewhere in the middle for that. Thank you. Uh, I'll leave that uh, with you. Obviously, you're a step ahead in that regard and trying to get uh, some people to listen to that. And thank you as well. Appreciate again this organization, uh, respectful of Council's objective of the 0% with boards and agencies, and proud to give your 126900. And thank you for recognizing our municipality's challenges as well. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, thank Madam you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. And thank you. Mike, you had a comment or question, information to contribute? Sorry, uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, just to Councillor Farr's previous comment, 
the reference to a presentation of Hamilton Place that was staff's here. So we'll be sure to correct that for next year, just in case Councillor Farr reads the footnotes next year. So we'll make sure they're thank on you. their toes now. Thank you very much. And I certainly want to add, Stephen, thank you so much for the presentation, for the budget, for coming in at zero. And, you know, as you were speaking there, I remember the dilemma that you went through a few years ago. And you know what? I just, I, I just wrote down when the going gets tough, the yeah. tough get going. And you've done a superb job and continue to do that. It is very much appreciated around this table. And I certainly hope that the art scene in downtown Hamilton has certainly contributed some of the uh, positiveness that's come out of, out of your budgets. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on now to Royal Botanical Gardens. And we have this presentation, then we will have one more from Theatre Aquarius. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, would you be able to send me your notes? Oh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Deputy Mayor, members of Council, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to pre present our plans to the committee here today. Our chair, Ian Brisbane, who is a Hamilton City rep, uh, sends his regrets he was hoping to come today. But I brought with me uh, my director of finance and administration, Andrew Duncan. Andrew is now uh, in his second year with RBG. Uh, he has been a wonderful addition to our team, identifying and implementing many things, including new policies, practices, and efficiencies to the, or, or the operation. And I brought him just in case there's some tough budget questions. Uh, we've been very uh, busy in 2013 with our business plan. Uh, Andrew uh, uh, has been uh, remarkable in this end, and I can't say how much uh, or how happy we are uh, with our uh, improvements in our finance area. Uh, hopefully, you'll have uh, received a copy of our budget and executive summaries. And before I get into the budget discussion, as in the past, I would just like to give you a very brief overview of some of the activities that we have been uh, up to at RBG. And although we are just starting our uh, 2012 audit, uh, we are hoping, and it looks very positive, to meet our another balanced budget. And if we do reach this, it will represent the eighth year in a row that RBG has achieved positive results. And this is an outcome of some very hard work by our board of directors, our dedicated staff, and many, many volunteers. This is also a direct result of the ongoing support of our core funders, the City of Hamilton, Halton Region, and the Province of Ontario for investing in us for so many, many years. 2012 was the first year of a three-year business plan that we developed last year, and the management team that developed the plans to see our attendance numbers and revenues grow. Uh, we've had ongoing awareness initiatives throughout the year, which have helped support a variety of our mandated activities. And overall, we had a very good year with paid attendance increasing by 24% and our self-generating revenues total increasing by 5%, which amounts to approximately $271,000. And although we are proud of these accomplishments, we did, however, fall short on some of our revenue targets. We were pretty aggressive in our budget. And as a result, we had to utilize uh, some of our year, uh, reserve funds uh, to balance the budget. When I say reserve funds, these are funds that we've got through donations or contributions for specific activities that we do. We would prefer not to touch them and let the funds grow, but uh, for the next couple of years we'll be accessing them to make sure that we are, our momentum is maintained. Uh, with an incredibly complex mandate from horticulture, conservation, education, and science, and a very diverse strategies, it is very difficult to compress our activities or implement efficiencies that we've not already done so in the early years of our transition. RBG is an extremely lean operation that depends on the hard work and efforts of our staff and considerable volunteer assistance in many areas of the operation. Close to 50,000 collective volunteer hours are, are contributed to RBG. And all of this has led to the stabilization of the organization, and we are extremely proud of this. That said, RBG cannot continue to just scrape by or just be stable. Uh, we need to use this momentum to move the organization forward, and the goal is to grow our reserves. We need them to live off of, we need them to deal with deferred maintenance, and to develop new products 
and gardens and features down the road. So we started a pretty aggressive uh, strategic planning exercise that started in the fall of 2012 and it has involved financial sustainability exercises. No idea is crazy. We're looking at everything as far as how we can raise even more revenues. And over the past eight years, we've done an incredible amount of work doing such, but we still have to do more to take it to the next level. And RBG's had many good news stories. Uh, this past year, we had our fourth winter exhibit entitled Chocolate, uh, which was held at RBG Center. And we were honored to have the uh, Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport, Michael Chan, on hand to officially open that event. Uh, we experienced good bloom periods and held wonderful festivals in the garden areas. And we made uh, significant improvements to our natural lands and trails. As some of you may not know that we have over 20 kilometers of na uh, uh, nature trails. And of course our marsh restoration efforts in Coots Paradise and Henry Valley uh, continue with fantastic success. Uh, our educational programming continues to be the most uh, respected around. Unfortunately, with the teacher, teacher's actions, where a lot of our programs are being canceled, like a lot of other agencies are experiencing, which is most unfortunate. Another initiative that we are taking the lead on is the Coots to Escarpment Land Use Master uh, Management Plan. Um, and uh, we've been able to do this through uh, funding from the Friends of the Greenbelt and the Trillium funding. And this initiative has been ongoing for seven years now and continues garner, to garner support throughout the region. And we look forward to uh, working together to maintain the public screen spaces for the enjoyment of future generations. It's a wonderful group effort with many stakeholders involved. We did have challenges, like we all do, to contend with as well. And although chocolate attracted uh, many uh, more visitors than our exhibit in 2011, uh, we fell short on uh, sponsorship revenues. So you're between a rock and a hard place. You've got to continue with these things. Sponsors want to see results. They want to see numbers. So we, um, we have to keep on forging. We've we got a couple of uh, special events happening. One opens this weekend called Battle of the Titans, and it's RBG's version of a dinosaur exhibit, which we're hoping will bring all kinds of uh, families and children of all ages to enjoy. That follows up a wonderful uh, holiday traditions uh, exhibit we just closed at the start of the month. Uh, we, uh, through the help of Celebrate Ontario, we got a grant to purchase a train. Train and gardens, for whatever reason, is uh, very popular throughout North America. And we had great numbers over the holiday season with, uh, with a train exhibit. I met with somebody who mentioned weather and rain. <laughs> this is my 29th year at RBG, which I can't believe. And I think I can count on one hand where we actually said at the end of the year, boy, we had great weather every weekend. And uh, so it doesn't happen that very, very often. But this past season it was a wet spring and then went right into intense heat. And our visitors don't like walking around gardens in intense heat either. So you can't really seem to win with the weather. So that's why we're developing display spaces. We have 12 month a year uh, activities. So we want to bring in the visitors on a year round basis. And it's, it's working. Uh, through the holiday season and all these exhibits are happy to report that our membership sales are up 13% over 2011 and we know uh, that's, that represents some 13,200 members of Royal Botanical Gardens, mostly from the community. RBD's transformation is evolving and will continue to do so for some time, but we have much to do. We have limited resources, but the reality is RBG needs to raise additional revenues. And we're going to be active in this strategic planning and our board of directors are committed to making this happen. So just a heads up, there's going to be conversations and, uh, and discussions and open houses and what have you uh, as we discuss our future plans. RBG continues to review its significant programs as we strive to achieve efficiencies, maintain our properties, provide desirable, desirable visitor experience, invest in revenue generating and value added activities, all while meeting a very diverse and important mandate for the people of this community, the province of Ontario and beyond. As a major cultural attraction in the region, RBG plays a key role in improving the quality of life, increasing pride and ec economic growth in our community. Like both, most organizations in both the private and public sector, the slow economy, economics recovery has provided significant challenges for us, particularly in fundraising. But that said, RBG is planning on adding to its program, programs and has the teams in place to address it fully again in 2013. 
I should note we raise o over a million dollars in, in actual grants to do a lot of the work that we do, which is uh, remarkable. Our Growing Up Green fundraising campaign continues to be successful in raising dollars to support our children's programming and conservation activities. And this includes activities such as Back to Nature, uh, Back to Nature program that deals with the term nature deficit disorder within our children. And RBG plays a key role in educating our youngsters to enjoy the outdoors. Now moving forward, our priorities for 2013 uh, will involve setting priorities, include some tough decisions that respond to the ever increasing costs. RBG has worked hard at generating our own revenues and will continue to do so as we're faced with another year of uh, funding cuts from the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, we had a, a percentage cut uh, last year and another one this year, so we're up to 2% in cuts. That say, I should remind you that in 2009, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport, I think it was the Ministry of Culture at that time, more than doubled our annual contribution from 1.9 million to 4.1 million. The, uh, understood the value of rural botanical gardens in this community. So these are small cuts comp considering the increase they gave us not too long ago. And as I mentioned, we had a successful holiday season. I uh, would like you to check our website to see more about the Battle of the Titans. This is going to be a good one. We invite you all to come and enjoy it. It runs from January 26th, which is tomorrow, if it all gets done, <laughs> uh, to April 7th, and that's at RBG Centre. Art in the Gardens will continue to play an active role here as uh, we investigate further partnerships. We've had uh, ZimSculpt, which was in and stone sculpture in the gardens. We're looking at a new partner for sculpture in the gardens. We do Wednesday night jazz. We have, uh, there's a lot of people in here that are in, into the music. We may have future uh, potential of uh, working with partners right here in our own community as well. So we make good progress in many of the uh, strategies that were within the multi-year plan. And uh, we, we, as a provincial agency, transfer payment, agency, transfer payment agency, we have to align our initiatives with some of the provincial government strategies, which we're happy to say we are doing. Um, the big news is that uh, it took us 13 months. There was a formal announcement of um, obtaining funding for the rejuvenation of our iconic rock garden. Um, and the money was, uh, the first phase of the money was finally deposited uh, over, the, over the holidays. So you're going to hear a lot more about the complete uh, renovation and upgrading of our uh, famous rock garden. And we hope to bring it back to the days of glory where there were lineups uh, that used to go into that rock garden. And it's a $20 million project. We were successful in having the provincial government and the federal government split 14 million of that. Uh, so we're well along and we'll be doing a fundraising campaign for the rest of it. Uh, looking forward to 2017, which is just around the corner, Royal Botanical Gardens has been an active participant in, uh, in something called Flora Niagara, Canada, and this 2017 called Wonders of Nature. This is an international horticulture exhibition that is being planned to be a true celebration of horticulture and a flagship event for the celebration of Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation. The event would take place in Niagara Falls, but RBG is being um, named and is a, a player in it as a significant satellite site. And the, the, the event is being promoted as a shining and international spotlight on Canada and the region's vibrant and economically significant horticultural sectors. It will create jobs before, during, and after the event. It will be a major tourism to draw, obviously, and position the region as an exciting garden experience destination and contribute overall to the healthy economic de uh, development of and the quality of life in the area. RBG will continue to assist in this endeavor. We're working with the regional tourism organizations, Landscape Ontario, and the event team in gardening and support for this event. It's a huge, a huge amount of money that has to be raised and they have to get support uh, for it and they're working hard on that now. Um, and we will continue uh, to work hard on promoting RBG in this community as a tourist destination uh, through our own efforts and those of RTO number three and of course Tourism Hamilton and their new structure. I see Hannah there. Our gardens are looking better and we have many new initiatives happening in 2013 including new garden development. We have a new natural playground for kids that officially opens this spring and we will continue with uh, gardens that are tied into the War of 1812 celebrations. We continue to be more customer focused or more customer focused as we aim to provide a high quality tourism and cultural experience. RBG does play a key role in improving the quality of life, good health, increasing pride and economic growth in our community. 
but we, some of you wonder what maybe what else does RBG do? Well, this is the response that I have, and if you just bear with me for that, these, these are the things that RBG needs to communicate and spread the word uh, as you were ambassadors of us as well. We serve people by providing opportunities for recreation, education, research, and conservation within the world of plants. Plants sustain all life on earth, and they change the world. They already have many times. We believe that we can cultivate change that improves the lives of Canadians and the environment of Canada. We've been specialists in, the edu in educating people about the benefits of the life of the life uh, a life with plants for over 60 years. Our products are knowledge, enjoyment, and well-being. We develop and disseminate knowledge that enriches lives and protects the environment through application of the arts and sciences of horticulture, botany, and ecology. We encourage enjoyment, romance, and fun by providing gardens, heritage landscapes, and other amenities where vis visitors can touch the, the enchanting world of plant diversity itself with all of their senses. We promote well-being through information and teaching about the many ways that plants serve people. This service ranges in scale from the personal and the local to the societal and global. And all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is right here in our own backyards. And we should be so thankful that we have this, uh, this crown jewel. Now regarding our budget, what you have in front of you is the draft budget that we submitted to your staff. Our board of directors approved our budget last month. Our ministry is reviewing the budget as we were talking here today. And uh, the finan financial shows on the last page, the operating expenditures, uh, projected revenues and funding requirements for the 2013 year. We have, complied, we have complied with the wishes of our core funders. That includes the City of Hamilton, Halton Region, and the ministry regarding our annual request. Um, for your information, Halton Region has approved their a contribution and you'll see they're, they're separated out on that budget sheet. As most of you know, there, there is a funding agreement with the Halton Region which establishes the annual, annual contribution of each supporter. We're here today to request uh, ongoing support from the City of Hamilton within your guidelines. We thank you again for your support and your time this morning and I'm open up to some questions, although I will say that our chair, as I mentioned, Ian Brisbane, would like to make a formal presentation to the council about all the things that we do at the gardens in a future date, and we'd like to get on, on uh, as a delegation on a future agenda. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy. Very Mayor. much, Mark. That's excellent. Um, always super news that comes out of the gardens. And um, process, you'll know, to go through the clerk's department to make that request for a future presentation. So, um, okay. standard process. So, um, Carolyn, would they go through yourself? SGIC legislative assistant, so it'll be Carolyn Biggs. Okay. And I'm going to turn now to questions. I have Councillor Jackson and Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Mark, there should be a picture of you in the dictionary beside the word persistence. Okay. And just, um, I'll have a team too that uh, will be there. <laughs> Anyways, I always appreciate the thoroughness, Mark, of uh, your presentations to us. Thanks again as well. Um, respectfully for the municipality's challenges financially that you came in at, at our objective of the zero from last year. And Madam Deputy Mayor, before I get a couple of quick questions to Mark, I remember it was about 10 years ago, I think former Mayor Wade uh, came to this body and led a review of the RBG in light of the some of the real difficulties that they were going through. I think a, a low point, if you will, in the RBG's history. And you've risen nicely from the ashes, Mark. And one area that I had suggested in my minor, small way of contributing was about memberships. And that's just tremendous to see the increase. Over 13,000, 9% increase in memberships. Because I always felt with something like an RBG, surely to goodness, Hamiltonians, Burlingtonians, it's something you take out a membership on. You're proud owner of a piece of what you have in this community, which is such a jewel. And I just felt that membership was a greater demonstration of that. And so I'm glad that there's been that kind of promotion in that area as well. And your attendance is up as well, Mark. That's great. Mark, two areas, um, food and food catering. Can you just give us an update on how that's evolved over the last few years? And uh, you've got a long-term contract, uh, satisfaction with the current food operation, uh, that kind of thing, Madam Deputy Mayor, through you, please, to Mark. Uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jackson. Um, food service is one thing that's just it's a joy to work with. <laughs> and we had, as you know, we've had our challenges with that over the years as well. 
very unfortunate because when that happened, that particular caterer was an excellent caterer and it was just very unfortunate. But uh, the current uh, caterer that we have, uh, she has the, uh, it's, it's complete. She is responsible for catering and responsible for our uh, year-round restaurant and our seasonal tea houses as well as any other small food services that are requirements. So it's an exclusive contract. We have a percentage of all gross sales of liquor and food. Uh, currently, we're having a great success uh, with it. Uh, not too many complaints, although I don't know how many people below me hear, hear them, but I'm not hearing any of them, and uh, we're quite happy right now. That's great, and obviously the, your reflective comments are reflective of the feedback overall you must be getting from patrons as well. Right. Mark, the area of sponsorships, I noticed that you don't have, I think you've put aside about 100 grand as an objective for 13. Similar to the art gallery, when I see the kind of donations across our community in the healthcare sector by some of the um, more blessed, wealthy families in our community, the DeGroots, Joyce's, Braley's, Jervinsky's, is there opportunities like that as well with the RBG in a greater form of sponsorships, either with events or a piece of the gardens? Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Mark, things like that. Well, sponsorships are a funny thing. Um, sometimes sponsors have sponsorships. When you look at what you get for the sponsorship, or what you got to produce in order to get that money, uh, sometimes they even, and I think I heard that earlier, sometimes it, it changes what you're trying to do to appease the sponsor. Uh, we would much rather go after the donations for specific projects, whatever. But we are, we do put, we put on these events and they do cost. And if we can get a sponsor to underwrite the rental fee of a roving exhibit, uh, that if, if that's covered, you, everything you make after that, every, every dollar you make in attendance is, is, uh, is, uh, is bonus. So um, uh, it's an area we have to grow on, okay. but uh, sponsors are being, they're being very careful with their money as well. So it sounds like it's on your radar, and I would just, as one member of council, encourage you to keep trying to pursue that to the greatest degree you can. Thanks, Thank Madam you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and good morning, or sorry, good afternoon, Mark. Um, Mark, one of the things that I just wanted to ask, more out of curiosity than anything else, the Arboretum, mm -hmm. in the wintertime, there's no gate at the front which thank you very much because every year on March break I would take my children there and they would go feed the chickadees. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes people, people will um, associate the RBG with springtime, summertime, but did they really, I, I mean, do you really um, uh, advertise that they can come in the wintertime too and experience the, the nature that way as well? Because putting your hand out with bird seed and having two and three chickadees land on your hand at the same time. I have pictures of my 18 month old at that time with his hand out with a chickadee on there getting yeah. a bird seed off it. So is there any... Well, uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor, I don't know if you, it's a good point and I don't know if spectator readers here, but on the announcement page, the classified section, right. I, I would think the spectator has an RBG photograph almost every second day in there. And it, it's just like that. I think yesterday was a cardinal. but And it's uh, it's hugely popular. Um, you know, a lot of our measurement, particularly with the provincial government, is what's your attendance, what's your attendance wall. If you know RBG's properties, and we, when we decided to charge on the 50th anniversary of RBG, what a, what a PR move. We started charging emissions when it was free for 50 years. I think it was 1991. We put in a mile of fencing, and we had to put in five separate kiosks because there was five different garden areas. It's staff them. And staff them. And really, you could get anywhere in RBG. It's, it's massive. You, can, you come up, and there's so much of it is available for free. So to put a number on how many people are in attendance in a year is a big guess for that. But like now you go, oh, there's a thousand people on Coots, uh, Coots Paradise skating, what have you. So I think, you know, we don't, if you're asking me if we promote that we're free, is that what but you're uh, I guess my point is that, yeah, I, I do see those those pictures in the paper, but mm -hmm. oftentimes I'm sure the general reader would look at that and think it was just a, a regular hiker going through, <laughs> but they don't understand that the Arboretum itself is, is free. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids can go in, it's all hands-on stuff. You grab the bird seeds, you drop your donation, and away you go, and yeah. you've got the most fun for an hour and a half feeding, yeah. and you'll never ever get rid of all that bird seed. You think you don't have enough, but oh. you could have 25 chickadees land on you, and you still won't yeah. get rid of it. We are, we are, look, we, we are, 
we're uh, cognizant of there are communities that maybe can't afford to pay an admission. So we're actually looking into how we how we promote this in the, in the future. Uh, but uh, there is, it's the best uh, the membership. If membership isn't the best deal in town, certainly the fact that you can get and see most of it for nothing is is another bonus for RBG. Yep. No, seriously, it's a real gem to do that, especially during the time of year. You wouldn't associate going there, and right. it's, to me, one of the best. It's less crowded. It's uh, got more to offer. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Deb. Thank you. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And uh, Mark, nice to see you here. That was yeah, a good presentation. You. And I will say that uh, our family regularly uses the Arboretum um, in, in all seasons. And I thank Councillor Johnson for bringing that up because the winter time to me is, is one of the better times, whether it's cross-country skiing or, um, you know, the other, uh, the other uh, activities. Um, two quick comments. On, I'm very pleased to see that one of your focuses and goals is to commercialize your, some of your space that you've mm -hmm. got and uh, through um, uh, previously Councillor Jackson talked about the restaurant but I'm just uh, can you just give us a quick overview because there's the conference center mentioned here the headquarters and your, your outdoor education and IMAX so uh, you know are you looking to uh, to uh, get more partners to lease that space again yeah this is what this is what we're that's what I mentioned through you uh, madam chair this, we have implemented a lot of revenue generating activities. There are things that we're doing now that we've never even been thought of before when we were sort of more focused on the mandate. But to support the mandate, you have to generate revenue. And we're at a certain level now, but we know we have to take it to the next level in order to continue with all the, the good work that we do within the science and research and education and conservation work that really, those are tough to raise revenues for. And so we've just had a couple of initial Blue Sky sessions and these are some of the things that are coming out. Let's not say we're doing any of them just yet, but that's part of the process that we're going through. And uh, yeah, no st stone will be left unturned if there's a uh, potential to work with a partner or what have you moving forward. So. Well, that's very encouraging, and you know, I congratulate your board of directors for looking at innovative ways to uh, to generate revenue, mm -hmm. um, because uh, you know it, it is certainly necessary. My one last uh, question for you, through you, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor, the province of Ontario. You mentioned that uh, the, the funding had gone from, I believe, you said 1.9 million to just over 4 million. Mm -hmm. Is that a long-term commitment? Has there been? Uh, any kind is it over certain years, or is it just a long-term commitment now that you can that you folks can count on coming in? Well, when they made that announcement in 2009, uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, um, the it wasn't the number that got me sort of excited. It was the fact they said ongoing. Ongoing was in the announcement, so and we we budget accordingly. <laughs> okay, so they haven't clearly defined ongoing, but but you're you have some assurance. I think it's about as much defined that they will ever do so all right well I hear what you're saying mm -hmm. well done congratulations and thank uh, you. that's it thank you thank you and uh, I certainly want to echo the comments around the table uh, being a resident at uh, my backyard was uh, Princess Point I certainly appreciate uh, what we have in this city we're very very fortunate and yeah. yes there's deer in the backyard right now so oh, that's a <laughs> huge problem for us <laughs> um, I just I did want to ask and it's not to be a down point but I know and I forgot to ask yesterday at the Conservation Authority meeting with the presentations Emerald Ashbor what's the impact that the RBG is going to have with regards to Emerald Ashbor and in in all of the areas that you cover um, in the city we're almost 25 million dollar hit it's it's there and we're dealing with it we've uh, we have a strategy I actually mentioned this last year and I actually uh, we, we got some funding, um, not a huge amount, but we got some funding last year through the uh, ministry, and uh, we got an injection program going on right now. We're monitoring it very closely, but uh, we are dealing with it uh, in our natural lands. And I think when I went through my notes here, I noticed that Councillor Johnson asked, actually asked, asked me about it, and I was supposed to give you a report. So you're late. <laughs> But, but that is a, that's a report. That's a report on Emerald Ash, and we're and we're following that program. 
So we're keeping we're keeping our fingers crossed because we have so much ash to find our properties as and the city does. As the city does, and then the reason I'm very passionate about this is uh, as a Ward 10 councillor, my ward is the biggest impact. 19% of our city streetscape trees, just the city streetscape trees, are ash. And I've had meetings with staff, and I am terrified. It is in the ward now, and um, I'm certainly hopeful that I mean whatever our staff can help working with you also, please uh, afford that opportunity of contact with them because I think it's going to be a concerted effort that we have to try and... Yep. and I can forward a copy of that to you, that report to you as well. Absolutely appreciate it. So my comments are there. I've got some suggestions of what going forward you may want to do later on, but I'll give them to you offline. Okay. Certainly excellent presentation. Great job. And Great. continue the good work. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And with that, the last but definitely not least is Cedar Aquarius. Oh, okay, oh, I there is okay, great. Mm. And welcome. <laughs> um, good afternoon, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, um, councillors, and the guests that have stayed, and our partners, Opera Hamilton. Um, um, we are here today with uh, two board members who could stay with us. Um, our treasurer on our board is um, uh, Blaine Cameron of KPMG, and our newest board member, Dave McCullough. Um, thank you for joining us today. On behalf of Theatre Aquarius, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today and to share a report of Aquarius' activities, success and successes and challenges of the past year and the year to come, and to demonstrate your return on investment in success that you have made in us. I want to begin with a with thank you. Um, and uh, major restoration projects like our energy efficiency retrofit are out of reach for not-for-profit performing arts organizations. In 2012, you joined with the Ontario Trillium Foundation, making it possible for the complete renewal of the curtain wall that fronts our theater center. In fact, they're only now taking down the scaffolding, so I don't have a finished picture for you to see, but do come by and see it, because it looks fantastic. Uh, this was the final stage of a $1.3 million effort that included replacing our roof and our HVAC systems. In addition to yourselves and the Ontario Trillium Foundation, other partners in this project were Ursler Middle DeFasco, private donors, and the federal government via Canadian Heritage. This tremendous team effort has renewed our landmark art centre for a new generation of Hamiltonians. Thank you most sincerely for your leadership role in allowing us to complete this $1.3 million project. This year, Theatre Aquarius celebrates our 40th season as Hamilton's professional theatre company. We are building on history, success, and continuity. We create world-class theatre that educates, challenges, and entertains. Yes, we love to entertain you, but our mandate compels us to reach even higher. We are privileged to create work like our acclaimed production of Where the Blood Mixes, which informed our audiences of the legacy of the residential school experience in Canada. 
And the show that closes our season, Time Stands Still, will challenge your perspective of the role of war correspondence. Our presentation here today will demonstrate we are a pillar for core revitalization and an economic engine for the city. We are a draw for tourism and a resource actively accessed by people in all parts of the city. We are inclusive and accessible to all members of the community. We are a creative industries leader and we help to deliver important principles of the city's cultural policy. Theatre Aquarius is, is, home for artistic, is a home for artistic creation, where the efforts of professional union performers and union stage technicians come together to create unique, relevant theatre that is, the, is among the very best in the theatre, in the country. As the Centre for Professional Theatre, we mentor local playwrights and develop the skills of professional actors. These numbers show you that Theatre Aquarius makes a consistent, reliable contribution to the life, growth and development of our downtown. We bring 120,000 visitors into the downtown every year for more than 230 events at the DeFasco Centre for the Arts, including our studio theatre series, literary readings, special school matinees, and 148 public performances of our main stage productions. Aquarius is active consistently throughout the year, making the kind of contribution to downtown businesses that makes a real difference. Um, this quote is taken directly from the City of Hamilton's cultural policy, and we could not agree with you more. Culture is a source of economic growth, employment and wealth creation, and culture is critical to downtown renewal. We absolutely agree. We found some friends in the community who agree as well. We spoke to restaurant owners who are directly impacted by the success of Theatre Aquarius who offered these words of support. I'm not going to read them all, but you can see that they are significant testimonials and not just from our nearest neighbours. James Street, John Street, Lock Street, restaurants all over the downtown are positively impacted when Theatre Aquarius succeeds. Our patrons make a night at the theatre a complete night out and it engages them in downtown Hamilton. There have been many wonderful things happening in downtown Hamilton recently, and of course we would love to take credit for them all, but we are only here to speak of the direct, demonstrable benefits, the provable impact of Theatre Aquarius on our city. When restaurants succeed, we see more restaurants opening. We see retail in the area succeed. We see greater food traffic and positive energy throughout our community. Theatre Aquarius makes a definite, measurable impact on other businesses in our downtown. When Aquarius succeeds, many visitors are drawn into the downtown. They invest in, town, down, in downtown businesses with their, with their patronage. The success of Aquarius impacts their staffing decisions, creates jobs and wealth in our community, and in so doing is absolutely vital to the renewal of the downtown core. And as these slides have demonstrated, it is tangible, it is measurable, and it is very real. During our holiday show, where we entertained over 11,000 people at, uh, at our production of Top of the Pops, we conducted a new, more detailed patron survey. We collected over 2,100 completed questionnaires, and what we learned is that the economic impact of Aquarius continues to grow. 86 percent of Theatre Aquarius patrons report dining out when they come to the theatre, a sure sign that the quality and quantity of dining options in the downtown continues to grow. More people report paying for parking than ever before. And together with significant impact of person years of employment and material spent with local vendors, Aquarius can report a direct economic benefit to our city in excess of $12 million. And where are those patrons coming from? As you can see from this map, patrons are coming from every part of our city. Each pin represents a unique household who has attended Aquarius since we last stood before you one year ago. Aquarius is an engine for the development of downtown, but we are also a rich cultural resource that continues to be accessed by people throughout the city. 
And expanding the same map beyond the borders of our city, we see that Theatre Aquarius is a significant draw for visitors into our city from all around the Golden Horseshoe and beyond. Theatre Aquarius is a magnet for tourism, just as your cultural plan says. More than 80, that's 80%, that's 80% of our patron respondents reported that when attending Theatre Aquarius, it had either improved or greatly improved their feelings about downtown Hamilton. Aquarius is not, ma not merely a magnet for tourism, but a genuine ambassador for our city, helping to change people's perception of the downtown. We strongly believe, let me have a glass of water here. We strongly believe that in order to make the greatest impact on our community, Theatre Aquarius must remain accessible to all members of society, regardless of age or economic circumstance. And through powerful partnerships, we've been able to grow more accessible than ever before. Our Pay What You Can performances, sponsored by Sun Life Financial, ensures that any member of our community has access to professional performing arts for the price of a donation in any amount. That could be 10 cents, that could be 25 cents, it could be $40. Our new youth accessibility programs, sponsored by TD Bank, is helping Theatre Aquarius to offer four additional school matinees, absolutely free to schools, identified as high needs. And the Insight Foundation for the Arts helped Theatre Aquarius to offer 200 tickets at no cost to organize, organizations working with First Nations citizens in our community so that they could come and attend Where the Blood Mixes, an Aboriginal production. And in the coming season, Theatre Aquarius will be expanding our lowest ticket price by more than a thousand seats per season, ensuring that we are truly a resource for the entire community. Here we see the breakdown of our audited revenues and expenses for last season. We continue to draw the lion's share of our revenue directly from box office sales. And 55% of our revenues are invested directly back into the on-stage product, ensuring the greatest impact on our audiences. We are in the business of creating theatre, and we believe in growing that business through fiscal responsibility and presenting a high-quality product. 2012 was a challenging year for not-for-profit theatres across the country. Through careful fiscal governance, Aquarius weathered these difficult times with a small surplus. However, while subscription sales were up by 10%, sales of single tickets was, was a challenge. For the coming season, we have put together a slate of very appealing productions and believe that we can meet our realistic box office goals. I can't share with you those productions today because um, our board meets on Monday evening and at that time they will approve the artistic season um, and then we can share it with you. But we do have some very exciting productions. Um, however, we have been advised by both the Canada Council for the Arts and the Ontario Arts Council that we can expect up to a 10% cut in our 2013 grants as those organizations reprioritize funding in favor of emerging artists and arts organizations. And let me explain a little because I've, been th I've sat through all the presentations and I know you've asked the questions. Um, Canada Council and the Ontario Arts Council, they fund sections. We're the theater section. And there are 160 not-for-profit theater companies in Canada. And I couldn't tell you the number of theater artists that are across the country. Um, and they, um, they are, like you, challenged to figure out a way in which they can fund new and emerging small theater and new artists without growing the pie. And as one of the larger theatre companies in Canada, there used to be 12, there's now 11, of course we will feel the hit because we get, uh, as, a, as, a larger, as a larger arts organisation, theatre organisation, 10% um, will, uh, will, will, 10% in our budget from both organisations represents about $34,000 uh, to our bottom line. In the budget that we submitted to you, and we thought about this very carefully, we are asking for an increase of 34,300 to help meet this budget gap. And could I just say at this point that 
you have been funding Theatre Aquarius for about um, six, 14 to 18 years. Um, in the first 12 to 14 years of that time, um, our grant, our annual grant, never came to Theatre Aquarius. It was directed to pay off property taxes that, want, that we once used to pay to you. Um, because those property taxes in arrears got as high as a million dollars. So it's actually only in the last four years that we have been receiving a cash payment from you of around $73,000. As Theatre Aquarius contributes so much at a municipal level, it is our hope that City Council will choose to invest in success and to keep Theatre Aquarius at a stable level of funding pending the results of the City's ongoing review of the granting program. And this slide will feel very familiar to those of you who recall last year's presentation because very little has changed. And perhaps the most dramatic change of the past year is the absence of Vancouver on the, on the first part of the slide. As you heard earlier, uh, we lost the Vancouver Playhouse this past season, a, a significant theatre production company, and it was in their, the, in their 50th year of service. These are challenging times for us all. Aquarius continues to be significantly below other Category A regional theatres across the country in terms of municipal grant as a percentage of operating revenue, support per capita, and overall municipal support. And the chart at the bottom hi highlights some of the obvious funding disparities with our sister organizations here in Hamilton. We understand that there, is a, that there is a review of the funding formula in process and support this council's commitment to fiscal responsibility and investment in success. We continue to wait as you do for the recommendations of this review and to council's reaction and response. It is our hope and our expectation that this review will result in a funding model that is based upon merit, upon a return on your investment, and upon a demonstrable impact on our city. Until that time, we continue to proudly serve the city of Hamilton, not just as a theater company, but as a creative industry leader, a key partner in delivering the city's cultural plan, and an organization with a profound impact on the health and growth of our downtown economy. On behalf of our board of directors and staff, thank you for your investment in theater queries to date. Excellent. Thank you very, very much for that presentation and uh, the slides. Excellent. Your slide controller. Superb job. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to turn to Councillor Collins and then Councillor Farr. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Madam Chairman. And I uh, first uh, want to thank uh, our staff at the uh, Theatre Aquarius. Um, you know, I've sat on a lot of boards and agencies and committees in my time here at the city and I have to say that um, they have one of the strongest boards in terms of their um, their expertise and their knowledge. Um, they um, they have a wealth of business knowledge around that table, more than I've seen on any other board, certainly that I've uh, been a member of. And, but they also have uh, it's a unique unique combination. We have um, you know strong business leaders around the table who have a, a very very strong passion for arts and culture, and and so. Um, uh, I'm very impressed with their operation. I've been on the board now for a couple of years, and and that's that uh, that board certainly is guided by some very strong staff people uh, at the uh, at the theater, uh, Lorna and Ron and, and their team, who've done a great job in terms of um, through very difficult years. We've you know not just Canada but the global economy has struggled over the last number of years, and and they've managed to hold the line on the budget. And as you can see here, we're, if you read our financial statement and uh, you'll see that we're in a very strong financial position. We have had a small surplus last year. Um, we, compared to other arts organizations in the city, if you were to look at uh, Lorna's chart, certainly we, we probably rely the least upon the municipal um, funding. But I would also just suggest that in, if you compare us to other organizations it, that are included in the budget book that we have in front of us today, they probably rely the least on government grants compared to any other organization. So I think we are probably in the 15% range. And you'll see that there are other organizations that are in the 50, 60, 
percent and higher range as it relates to municipal, provincial, and, and uh, nationwide grants that are available to organizations. So we're, we rely, uh, thank you for that, we rely in large part upon our ticket sales and other development fundraising efforts to, uh, to, cr to get us across the finish line on an annual basis as it relates to trying to meet the, um, the expense line on the bottom there. With that having been said, I, I have to say that one of the probably most uh, healthy discussions we've had around our table at the Theatre Careers Board is the whole issue related to the city's grants process. And as Lorna rightfully po pointed out earlier, um, our theatre uh, uh, has received uh, very little in the way of m municipal increases. In fact, if you look at the book, the chart will show you that in the last 10 years, we've received ab absolutely zero uh, additional funds above the 0% line. So no additional municipal funds have come our way as a result of the grants process. And as the one chart shows um, and illustrates, that's not the case for other organizations. If you, again, compare us to other organizations in the city, some have received in the order of 15% uh, over the last um, eight to nine years. Some have received 20% increases. Some, I think, are in the 25 to 30% range in terms of municipal grant increases. And so our board, upon reflection, starts to look at those historic trends and says, you know, we're, we're fighting for the same um, dollars that are within the, the pie of municipal grants to arts and culture organizations. And we certainly look at our impact, as other organizations do, on the local economy. We look at we bring, uh, what we bring to the table in terms of employment. We look at the spin-offs in terms of what Lorna rightfully pointed out, in terms of downtown uh, development and, uh, and the infusion of dollars that come um, into the downtown and into the city as a result of the patrons that um, uh, turn the turnstiles at, at the Aquarius. And so uh, upon reflection of, of all of that information, We've had a very spirited discussion, very very spirited discussion and debate around our table about what's the city doing to change the scenario, which is really a, a scenario of the have and the have-nots. There are certain organizations that are not as healthy from a financial standpoint as we are in terms of our reliance on private monies. There are other organizations who rely more so on uh, government grants. There are organizations that might have less attendance than, um, than the theater has. And so, you know, we see ourselves in a very strong position as it relates to all of the criteria that I just referenced. And yet, for whatever reason, we are at the bottom of, let's call it the pay scale, as it relates to municipal grants. And so what our board has asked for is really, we are really looking forward to the recommendations, as Lorna said at the conclusion of her presentation. We're really looking forward to the outcome and the recommendations that come from our, our review of how our grants are distributed across the city. And, and maybe I can ask through you, Madam Chairman, to Lorna. Lorna, is there, I may have missed something along those lines, but maybe you can better reflect for, for council and committee the concerns that our board members have raised as it relates to um, not the not the dollar amount that we that we receive, but in terms of the fairness and equity issue that has been talked about, I think, for the last three or four board uh, meetings at the very least, and certainly this has become an annual discussion now for us at the theatre. Uh, um, Madam Deputy Chair, yes, uh, lots of discussion around the board table. And based on the fact that this is the kind of contribution that Theatre Aquarius is now making to the city. And uh, yes, we did have some troublesome years um, back in the uh, the mid to late 90s through the, through, uh, through the last decade. Um, but I think now we're hitting our stride. We have been hitting our stride. Uh, the programming that Ron Ulrich, our artistic director, brings bring to the city and he can't be here today actually because he's directing our next production which stars Jamie Farr of MASH fame so no, relation, no relation to Jason Farr <laughs> No, but I'm sure Jason would like a little bit of that acting career. Um, and uh, and so uh, we have we we are we are bringing um, vibrant, dynamic program into this community, and um, our subscription numbers are showing that our our single ticket sales. 
do show that, but we're up and down because the, we know we are in an, an economy where, where uh, it, you know, it's not to, we're not back to uh, we're not back to the original economy of before 2008, um, and and people's perception of their wealth plays on whether or not they're going to spend money um, to to, uh, to go out and entertain themselves um, or to choose to come to a, th a theater production. So it's so we have to you know we have to put on the very best productions that we can um, in order that people can come out and say, boy, you know that was fantastic. You got to go and see it. Um, we have a very limited marketing budget run by our director of marketing, um, and we rely a lot on on um, on the strength of our programming, the word of mouth on the street, um, and you can see that um, that we're because of the programming choices, we are pulling people from around the Golden Horseshoe um, as well as Hamilton, and having that impact on uh, uh, on uh, on the on the local economy. And now we can show that that we now we're able to show that we are also helping you deliver your cultural deliver your cultural plan, and uh, and that's exciting news for us to be able to partner with you in doing that. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lorna. And just um, maybe one last question, and that is um, as it relates to the process that uh, the city's undertaking in terms of soliciting or trying to understand from local or arts and cultural organizations as to how the, um, the, the new funding formula will, will unfold. You've been a participant and I think you've shared personally with our staff uh, your concerns as it relates to the current funding formula and I think you've, you've provided some input as it relates to how you feel it should be revised to reflect some of the issues that you've raised in your presentation. Can you expand upon that? Um, well, I think um, uh, um, I think it's our feeling as an organization that um, you're you're investing in success uh, because because the, the dollars that you're providing uh, to arts organizations is is you know it's our job to then leverage those dollars and and show the impact that we have in return um, uh, as as drawing more people into our into our uh, into our theaters into museums um, and uh, and and showing the impact that it's having on the on the downtown in return. Um, I think have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah thank you. You know, I, I hate to point to um, other organizations, but uh, you know, if I use the art gallery as an example, they're um, they're receiving about a million dollars a year, and I'm not asking you for a comment here, but this is my own comment. They're they're receiving about a million dollars a year. I think today. Um, Louise stated that their figures are up to about 250,000 patrons a year through their doors. And if you look at our municipal grant of 73,000, we're generating about half of that. And so when, when you start to look at, again, the economic comparisons and, and the, the benefit, the return on your investment, not that we're not getting anything from the art gallery or others, that there needs to be an apples to apples comparison as it relates to who gets how much because we know that the arts and culture pie here at the city is um, is limited there there is a ceiling on that and and so it's about fairness and equity and i i want my council colleagues when we leave today, i would just want you to think about the comparison of you know what groups receive how much and, and how we can seek to, to alter or change the policy to reflect one that is more equitable and is more fair and one that you can rationalize at the end of the day if in fact we are receiving an inquiry from someone who resides in this community or someone who sits on one of the boards or agencies. Right now that would be hard to do because really there is no rhyme or reason as to why certain groups get a certain amount of money. So I, I want to end with that and I want to thank uh, Lorna again. She's a very strong presenter, very passionate about the theatre and very passionate about the city and the downtown, as I'm, I'm sure you all know from hearing Lorna in past presentations. Thank you, Councillor. Very well said. And certainly the economic engine page of your presentation lays out basically what Councillor Collins is trying to uh, reiterate of the, the offshoot benefits that's, uh, that creates created from theatre queries. I'm going to go on now. I have Councillor Farr and then Councillor Jackson. I'm only going to be about a half an hour. Um, no, I, I, I'm kidding. Sam's got to go. Uh, I would echo everything uh, Councillor Collins has said. My fellow board member, Collins, by the way, no relation to uh, 60s uh, folk uh, hero Judy Collins. Uh, I, I'm glad we, uh, we, we kept it, Madam. 
deputy mayor. I heard that. On all, you were just reiterating Johnson's usual jabs. I would uh, I would like to thank them for leaving it on this uh, very important uh, slide, and uh, just I'm, I'm hopeful that all of my colleagues just took a look at the blue streams, especially, and 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 are really contemplating the comparisons and 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 heard what it was my fellow board member uh, uh, Ch uh, Councillor Collins had to say with respect to all of this. We talked about it last year, uh, and as the word to uh, Councillor, I think it's imperative to reiterate all that the Theatre Aquarius does uh, for the economic impact of, of downtown. Town Hamilton. I mean, we saw it in the presentation. I'm glad we brought our principal rather than the stand-in to work the slides because Greg did a great job, and and I work with Greg uh, uh, on the International Village BIA. He's a very committed individual who actually lives downtown, knows a lot about the area, particularly in International Village around Theater Aquarius, and and these are just two of the fine staff. Yeah, so I'll just speak to this. The, the things that maybe were just alluded to in that, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, just right from the ushers to everyone else in this organization, they really do this city proud. This is a, a first class people's theater in Hamilton that rivals any other across the country. And uh, from the ushers right on, on up to our artistic director, who many have heard probably do the radio spots and probably he, his work just on selling, let alone the great acts that he is very good at booking and he's well known for this, but just on selling the theater and the performances uh, is a testament to uh, the success, the recent success of uh, always successful theater Aquarius. So people need to understand that. And and uh, I know it probably wasn't easier for Lorna uh, to come up here, and, uh, and particularly given that uh, you know we do have these restraints, and we have operated in this term of council uh, in uh, suggesting uh, at all costs, in many cases, we maintain this zero percent. Uh, 35 or whatever the number is, is not all too significant when we look at this, when we understand the economic impact to downtown Hamilton, and when we put it in perspective with respect to uh, other facilities of a similar nature that provide the, the people's professional theater uh, to their cities, and many of them much smaller when you look at this uh, particular slide. So um, on the note of the CPP review, this coming Monday night, and I thank Councillor McCaddy for reminding me, if you're hearing about arts funding today for the first time and the issues around it and our CPP and you want to learn more, uh, 7 o'clock this coming Monday night at the Public Library, immediately following our board meeting at Theatre Aquarius, um, there's a public event at the Public Library with respect to where we're at with the Arts Funding Task Force, with what the uh, uh, Arts uh, Advisory Commission has been doing of late, and uh, you get to uh, offer your input uh, as well there. And I know I'll be representing and offering input as a board member of Theatre Aquarius. Uh, and also speaking uh, at that event at 7 o'clock at the Public Library this coming Monday night. Uh, I just want to ask two very brief questions. Uh, regarding this slide, uh, Lorna, it's not trumped up, it's not fabricated, it's not exaggerated. These are actual, real numbers that we're looking at before us through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, the first slide was put together, it's the same information that you saw last year because um, it came from the Business from the Arts survey, which they do every couple of years. Um, so the information came from uh, the Business for the Arts. Um, and uh, we just took off Vancouver Playhouse because Vancouver doesn't, the Vancouver Playhouse doesn't exist anymore. And then these numbers are the same as for last year as were provided uh, uh, to me uh, of course because it was public information. Um, so we've used, we've used exactly the same numbers because the picture hasn't changed. And then, if Greg, you can turn to the economic impact slide. Again, not fabricated, not trumped up. You, you alluded to the way you studied and looked at this research and talked to patrons. Um, the, uh, this, the first number, 6.2, actually was an Ontario Arts Council um, uh, survey that was actually done in the 90s. We probably have a greater impact than that, but they have not re redone that survey. So we're, we're still using the 6.2. Um, the 86% of our patrons, as I explained, we did um, a, a, um, a survey of our patrons who came to the top of the pops uh, for the four weeks over uh, over uh, December uh, through to early January, and uh, we received over 2,100 responses. And um, last year, uh, the number, the last survey that we did was in was in um, um, 88, uh, 2007 or 2008. 2007, 8, and the numbers of people that dined 
out was 55%, and this has now grown to 86%. Um, and the average, uh, the average meal cost back in 2008 was $30. This has gone up slightly to $38. Um, and we had a range from anywhere of somebody paying $150 for dinner out, I don't know where they went, to, uh, to $25. So um, parking fees uh, paid by patrons, uh, we found that more people were paying for parking, so I don't know where they were parking before, but they're certainly parking and, and helping uh, city parking lots and, and private parking lots around the theater. And then, of course, we have to we, we have a theater business that we run, and we we buy locally, um, and uh, um, uh, using steel wood and everything else in between. And uh, this is what we put back into the local economy. Yep, I, I caught those slides as they were. You were talking about economic impact. Wolfgang's quote stands out the most uh, from the Black Forest, where uh, there it is, right there. You're good, Greg. Theater Aquarius makes a huge impact on our dinner crowd on theater nights, and he says, I schedule our staffing by the theater schedule. So I think that speaks volumes from a long time um, uh, member of the restaurant industry in downtown Hamilton. I'm going to stop there. Great presentation. Very well done. Greg, you're uh, as good as a flautist any day of the week. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor, and I'll just uh, end by saying it. I'm just uh, very proud to be working with Councillor Collins as uh, council reps on uh, this uh, significant board. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jackson, and I have Councillor Partridge. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor, and uh, thank you always for the thoroughness, Lorna, of your presentation. And um, I think your uh, Vine Dining experience, which is one of their major fundraisers during the year, I think it's been going on for about 20 years, give or take, and that's one event of very few that my wife insists on, the two of us going to, and it's just been a fabulous success, contributions going to Theatre Aquarius. Um, Lorna, just help me understand, I was out of the room for a minute, you may have said it, but just if you would... Um, um, say it again, you anticipate a reduction federally and provincially. Has that occurred and is there any way of halting that from potentially happening? Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Lorna. Um, it hasn't occurred. We are now in um, we are now in in the process of writing our our grants to both the Ontario Arts Council and the Canada Council for the next two funding cycles. And uh, we received uh, uh, we received written word back in uh, October and early November uh, by both organizations that uh, uh, because of their be, 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 uh, and the Canada Council for a whole year has been touring the company get, touring the country getting information on how they may how they would structure using the same pie that they have to fund new and emerging art uh, theater groups and theater artists. And um, and uh, and uh, we were part of those discussions, uh, and they came back and have told us that uh, that uh, along with uh, along with we we're, I think there's a built into that is a three percent budget reduction that we can that's that's part of the the, the federal government's cuts uh, that we can expect up to ten uh, percent, and the same with the Ontario Arts Council. They they're, they're, those are now policy decisions. They cannot be changed and um, I just learned I appreciate thank you for that explanation which seems like it's out of your hands obviously with the uh, decision makers federally provincially but I, if I recall I asked most of the groups today about the federal uh, grants about the Ontario Arts Council and I think most of them expressed a stable funding uh, continued funding three-year program funding so I'm dismayed. I mean, you folks are just as worthy, so I'm dismayed to understand, have you fallen outside of a definition or within the moving forward policy, Madam Deputy Mayor, through you? Um. Um, Madam uh, Deputy Chair, the um, um, I don't know where those other arts organizations are in that cycle. They could be midway through their three years. We all work on a different cycle, and our cycle uh, has ended, and we're starting a new one for for this next fiscal 13-14. Um, we are we will have our, our our grant request 
into the uh, into the Can into Canada Council by the 15th of February, and then it's uh, uh, then it's the beginning of March for the Ontario Arts Council. So we're now on a on a new uh, on a new funding cycle with them, and that's why we've been told. I don't know where museums and uh, symphonies are in in their funding cycle, but again, we're all uh, we're, they're, they're, they have these um, funding groups um, and. Uh, Theater is. There are many more theaters, um, and and uh, than there are museums and symphonies in this country, and uh, and it's the one area that keeps growing because um, anybody who has got a theater background can start creating a theater company, and uh, and they all they are all been they've been knocking at the doors of those two organizations and asking to be funded. Okay. Thanks, Lorna. Um... Hopefully, with the number of the groups that have been um, expressing frustration with the rental costs at Hamilton Place, and all of them pretty well earmark yourself as where the venue we'd like to go, a little smaller, more intimate venue, and much more affordable. That hopefully has helped your revenue stream and your bottom line, Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Lorna. Um, Madam Deputy Chair, um, we... Uh, we are delighted uh, to have Opera Hamilton uh, as a partner with us in the DeFasco Center for the Arts. We went there, we approached them when we heard that they would be leaving uh, Hamilton Place because we could see it, because there was synergy between the performing arts um, and the great job that they do with their opera and we wanted to find a way to fit them into our season. In doing that, we had to give up some of the things that we do and one of the things, one of the areas that got hit because our season now extends way into the very end of May and into early June. And one of the things that we had to do uh, to to accommodate um, a like um, organization was we used to have a, 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 um, a theater production for, for, for young people and we could no longer put that into our season. Um, so we've had to take some sacrifices to do that. The other thing too is, is that we really felt that by bringing their audience members to Theater Aquarius, we felt that there might be some synergy in in in, in there being exchange in um, that that some of their subscribers may join Theatre Aquarius as a subscriber and vice versa. Um, and so when we were putting a, when we were putting a number together for uh, uh, for uh, Opera Hamilton, um, we're actually the fifty five thousand dollars that we charge them in annual rent for the eleven productions, and they're in the building for about thirty three days. Um, uh, hardly covers the cost of, 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 um, of the heat, light, water, having the auditorium, um, all of those lights burning, you know, we, we, we eat up a tremendous amount of electricity in our building. So, so, so and the $55,000 rent is only uh, one quarter of what we would charge one-off rentals. So Lorna, I, w I appreciate that. I, I didn't mean, forgive me, I didn't mean to pit one uh, new uh, renter no, no. against another. I just in my very simplistic mind, I thought if you've had some dark days at the theater hall and some folks are saying we'd much rather be, I just thought that was adding to performances and potential revenue. Uh, you know what, we... Like it might be a wash. And yeah, stuff. we don't actually, we never really ever had very many dark days because our, our theater, um, our productions took up like 97% of our season. Okay. So, Lorna, just to wrap up, Madam Deputy Mayor, um, It'll be hard for me to, to, as one member of council, in light of the zeros primarily across the board, <clears throat> to absorb the 34,300 that you're anticipating loss of this year from my standpoint. However, in light of what Councillor Collins has so eloquently uh, expressed, and a couple of hours ago, I said how fortunate and lucky the art gallery is to have a 10-year plan of 3% a year guaranteed, council approved, but one of very few, if no other organization, having the, uh, the ability to, to be able to bank on that. I'm fully with Councillor Collins in the comparisons he's made, and I'm fully on side with the Arts Review to hopefully be able to help you moving forward down the road. At least that's the best commitment I can give today moving forward, just from my standpoint. Thank Thanks, you. Lorna. Thanks, Thank Madam you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor, and I'll just be a very, very brief uh, question for you, Lorna. Excellent presentation, by the way. When is the launch date for the new season? 
Um, well, we what we do is our launch date is um, about February the 18th when we send out our, our, all of our renewals to our um, to our existing subscribers. So we have we have a uh, we're looking at doing that the week of February the 18th. Okay, but you used to have kind of a, a launch where you'd have a press release and and everybody would come in to the lobby. Right, and right, and. Um, um, actually, um, we changed that model because um, because it wasn't the best way of investing those funds on that day, and we really needed to be putting it into into telemarketing. We took we took those dollars and we now spend it on uh, on an acquisition campaign so that we can be so that we have a telemarketing program that will that actually results in it resulted in 600 new subscribers for us last year. And that's fine. That's fine. I just thought I didn't want to miss it if you were going to have one. No. If you're not, that's fine. Um, and the only other thing I want to say, I want to recognize Lorna for her Woman of the Year recognition from the YWCA's oh, Woman you. of Distinction. Thank you. As being a past recipient myself yes. and being at the event, knowing your background and all the years you've been in the community, I was just delighted to see you up there. So I want to offer my congratulations. Thank you. And Thank you uh, just outstanding. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. I wonder if I could ask uh, you to put this slide up with the comparisons for other municipalities for a second. Uh, and I, I just, uh, Councillor Farr uh, raised uh, the fact that on Monday night uh, at the library, uh, the Arts Advisory Commission is going to be reporting on an uh, update on how we fund the arts uh, here in Hamilton. And you know, uh, this slide uh, certainly speaks to that. Uh, we always look to London as a, as a comparator municipality. It's uh, similar in size. You know, it's different than... Uh, than the uh, provincial capitals uh, that you see up there. Uh, Calgary's not a capital, I guess Edmonton is, but a similar sized city to, to uh, Edmonton. And then of course Winnipeg and Halifax are in that category. But London is uh, similar to us. I don't know if uh, folks remember, but uh, when the art gallery uh, uh, came to us a couple of years ago and, and we, uh, we sat down and we worked out the arrangement that we have currently uh, with them, they put up a similar slide and uh, identical kind of numbers, um, not the same numbers of course, there's different funding for an art galleries in uh, different municipalities, but the orders of magnitude were, were very similar uh, and Hamilton was uh, was way down the list, uh, not unlike the uh, the numbers we see here. And then when the Arts Advisory Commission came uh, to us a uh, year, year and a half ago uh, with, with the very first uh, presentation to us on the work that they're doing, reviewing how Hamilton uh, funds the arts. Uh, they put up a similar slide again, uh, and, it, and again, uh, Hamilton uh, generally on, on how we fund the arts overall uh, through our grants uh, was way down the list compared to other municipalities. So, you know, I think that the uh, request here today is is entirely in keeping with with where we need to go in Hamilton uh, for Theatre Aquarius specifically. But I think uh, on, on Monday night and then back to Council at some point in time through the Arts Advisory Commission, we're really going to have to to come to grips with uh, with the value of the arts uh, in Hamilton. And we've seen it today writ large through all the presentations we've had all morning and into the afternoon uh, capping with this fantastic presentation in terms of the spin-off economic benefits, which I think I'd like to think that many of the art, other uh, arts presentations could do somewhat similar, uh, perhaps not the same, maybe not as good as Theater Aquarius, uh, but, but a somewhat similar uh, economic benefit spin-off uh, and all the work on James Street North uh, would, would be a similar uh, story, uh, Super Crawl, uh, Madam Deputy uh, Mayor, and some of the other uh, arts events we have across the city. So. You know, this is a, a, a supportable, in my mind, a supportable uh, request uh, articulated by Theodore Aquarius, uh, supported by Councillor Collins' comments. Uh, and uh, I think it's something I'd like to, to encourage Council to consider in spite of our 0% uh, percent, percent, uh, perspective uh, with our budget. I still think there's room for investing, um, uh, and I'll use the term extraordinary, which means extraordinary, more than we normally do, uh, or we have for the last couple of years in, in certain sectors, in exchange for very clearly demonstrated economic benefit. 
and, and we've seen that uh, today. I think we're going to see that, <coughs> excuse me, from the Arts Advisory Commission, not only from the organizations that we've heard from today, but from individual artists as well and what they contribute to, uh, to a city. Uh, we've seen that on James Street North. So that's a bit of a diatribe, uh, Madam, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, that touches on the theater chorus presentation, but it's sort of a more general comment, I think sets us up for what we're going to get here uh, from the Arts Advisory Commission. And it's something that uh, is really uh, an exciting thing for Hamilton to, to be where we are for, from an artistic perspective and to be able to leap ahead, I think, with some additional uh, investment in the arts in the, uh, in the months uh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCaddy. Um, very good comments, actually, and appreciate that. So, no more comments and questions. And uh, I thank you for the presentation. Equally excellent presentation. Tremendous job. And uh, we'll certainly be moving forward when we deal with all of the uh, reports as uh, we move forward. So I'm going to ask committee now that I have a mover and a seconder for all the presentations today. Councillor Johnson, Councillor Morelli, all in favor? Carry. And on that also, we have no motions today. Councillor Farr, you have a notice of motion you want to put forward. I do, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank I'll, I'll uh, bypass the whereases and just get to the uh, notice. Um, and you could read uh, the article in the Hamilton Spectator today by Carmela Frigmoni um, with respect to this. That, uh, move that the uh, Hamilton Police Services Board be requested to investigate the feasibility of adopting a public access online crime mapping service similar to that of Halton for the residents of Hamilton and report back to Council on its viability at a future GIC. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and that stays on. It's a notice of motion, everyone. And before we close off, just in process, I just want to be sure, because I know I stated yesterday we received, with regards to police services budget, we received correspondence from the Chief that I had mentioned that we received it, and I thought it was moved and seconded. I did tell Carolyn today, but I'm going to ask we formally move and second receipt of that piece of correspondence yesterday that was in the agenda. Councillor Jackson, Councillor Johnson, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Just so Carolyn has the records clean. Thank you, Carolyn. And now may I have a motion to it? Sorry. Yes, sir. So, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, if I could please. Um, besides police, of course, yesterday, CHH Housing, which Councillor McCaddy and I met with Joanne Priel and has been explained, they'll be part of Joanne's overall departmental budget through Gillian Hendry. But HECFI, I think all of you may have seen a rare e email from yours truly. Um, anyways, um, I sent out one about HECFI, and I believe the city manager and John Hertel are on site. I hope my colleagues are by majority as well, that I believe HECFI should come in Tell us how 2012 went. Yes, if everything unfolds the way it's been planned for, in spite of some hiccups recently, that uh, yes, they're going to turn the facilities over this sometime this year, if it all goes according to Hoyle. But Madam Deputy Mayor, still to report on 12, maybe answer some of the discrepancies of bookings going into 13, that kind of thing that's been recently in the media. I think it's germane for HECFI, and I believe Mr. Hertel is uh, eager to come in and, and still do the delegation request, even though they wouldn't be necessarily requesting any money this year from Council because of eventually the transition and turnover. So I just leave that with you, Madam Deputy Mayor, is chairing this month. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Partridge. Uh, yes, just very quickly, Madam Deputy Mayor, and I, I don't mean to jump on this because Brian, uh, Councillor McCaddy, is the chair of housing, but uh, we, he did send a request uh, out for them to uh, consider coming in and presenting to us. This body is the uh, shareholders, and so they are required to come in and, and present their budget to us. And my understanding, Brian, is that it's going to be uh, probably in March. So they will be coming before this council. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the comments, and I was under the impression that everything has, is being looked into as coming forward. My only reason today was to be sure through process that we had a document received. Carolyn, please. Through the chair, if I can respond to Councillor Jackson's concerns, uh, it is my understanding that HECFI will be coming in to the General Issues Committee meeting on January the 31st, and at that time they will be doing their presentation on budget, and also the committee will be dealing with the issue that was referred back by council on Wednesday night, so that is being looked after. With regard to the Police Services Board budget, we are arranging for the Chief to come and make a presentation possibly to the February 6th GIC meeting. Thank you. 
Thank you. And before we adjourn, I did also want to add my comments similar to yesterday. I really appreciate, and I know many of them all have left now, but the boards and agencies have heard loud and clear and have done their very best in coming in at uh, zero. Uh, which was our uh, directive. So it is appreciated by everybody that's been around this table in the last couple of days and certainly for all of council when we move forward in our budget deliberations. So now may I have a motion to adjourn. Councillor Pasuda, Councillor Morelli, all in favor? Carried. Thank you, everyone.